Hello everyone. Mike's working, isn't it? Yeah. Hi again. Yeah, just uh, more of a casual stream tonight. Uh, but I was going to continue on from the Patricia Cromwinkle thing because I never actually showed you the documents from the Process Church thing, did I? About the private detective that her lawyer hired. So I thought I'd show you that. And there's also some clips of her first interview ever uh, that you see. Uh, because you literally, you, though you see interviews of Susan and Leslie like in the 70s, you don't see any of Cranwinkle until about 1996. So, yeah, um, it's her first parole hearing and there's some interview footage. So we could look at some of that, I thought. But this is just a more casual one. And yes, I reached uh, I'm at 1,004 subs last time I looked. So, yeah, um, uh, I didn't think I'd reach it by tonight. Uh, so my thousand subscriber special is still going to be Sunday night. I'm going to talk about the Grateful Dead. So I found some interesting stuff about the Grateful Dead. But yeah, welcome everyone. And yeah, if uh, you're watching this on playback, I'll make sure there's a chapter for when I'm starting at the actual presentation. I'm just going to talk to everyone for a second, obviously, because this is a live stream. Hello. Mark, Jeff. Family Guy, oh, are you, is this your first live show? Hi there, yeah, this is one of the more casual ones, but I've actually got some stuff to present. And I've got my first, um, well, my thousand subscriber special, haven't I? And uh, yeah, I thought The Grateful Dead would be a good subject to talk about because of all the CIA theories about them, and that should be interesting. Because there's a couple of FBI documents about The Grateful Dead, because they did get busted for LSD. And there's another one about Jerry Garcia that I've now got a better explanation for that's interesting as well though uh but yeah the proof that this because yeah i heard a couple of years ago that there's now like absolute proof that one of them was cia but i've looked into it and actually the proof has been greatly exaggerated there's no proof that any of them was cia yeah so but yeah so tune in for that on sunday that's my th thousand subscriber special yeah oh capone now if you saw my message hello capone yeah uh on reddit yeah, just read over that. Something may happen. And little Mikey's here. Little Milky. I always call you little Mikey. You're little Milky, aren't you? Sorry. <laughs> There's a message on Reddit. Something may happen at some point, but don't worry. <laughs> I mean, I'm having a drink tonight as well, because I need it to talk about this crazy bitch. Well, all of them, really, don't you? Yeah, oh, Bella's here. Yes, and this, uh, well, uh, uh, it's all about the process church, so I'm only going to read out the significant parts. I'm not going to talk much about the process church. If you want me to do a stream about the process church, I could do. But it has been totally debunked that there's any link between Charles Manson and the process church. All you need to know really is uh, the process church, uh, the guys that started it were previously Scientologists who broke away. And you know what Scientologists are like about people who break away? They start to like cause shit for them, don't they? And also, there's actual evidence that Charles Manson had a link to Scientology uh, uh, through Bruce Davis, and he was in prison. He was in the same cell as a Scientologist, apparently. So there's like a tenuous link to Scientology for Charles Manson. And so the pro the the, the Scientologists had an interest in making you know diverting attention to the Process Church. But there's actually no evidence that anyone from the Manson family ever met the Process Church before their trial when they were trying to get this article out. All right, so no, it was nothing to do with the Process Church. There is no link. So don't, you know, it's it's, it's uh, pointless to look into it, really. But yeah, the, the thing that I uh, wanted to read out from the uh, transcripts of this court case, though, was the interesting thing about the fact that Cranwinkle's attorney hired the same private detective that Ed Sanders was using. And you hear a little bit. So, yeah, I'm just going to read out two parts because there's only two parts that's relevant. Most of the other parts, they're talking about the process church. But Paul Fitzgerald was a lawyer and he talks. And uh, they talked to the private detective at one point. And there were two bits that were interesting that I'm going to read you out. And if you do want to stream about the process church, because they say some interesting stuff in this in, in this thing. So if you want more detail, I will read it out. Yeah, I know. Well, oh, congratulate me. I'm a thousand and four um, subscribers now. So I hit a thousand subscribers. And last time I looked, it was a thousand and four. So, yeah, that's a big goal for a YouTube channel. Took me years to reach it. But, yeah, <laughs> I'm finally there. I live on the Isle of Wight. Yeah, I'm on the Isle of Wight. Yeah. 
Oh, and Linda's here. Don't worry, not Linda Kasabian from Beyond the Grave. Yay. I've been to you. You're here every week, aren't you now? Yay. And Dawn is back. Hey, are you feeling better, Dawn? Yeah, so yeah, you're saying it was it getting really bad with your health. I'm glad you're better and you're able to show up tonight. That's good. Yeah. Yeah, 1,000 1, people could finally cause a crowd stampede. No, but that, that makes me officially an influencer. Do you know that? Getting a 1,000 subscribers makes you an influencer. Yeah. So I am now an influencer. Yeah. Have I been to Liverpool? No, I haven't actually been to Liverpool. My family are from County Durham which is sort of near Liverpool, up up in the north of England, but I've never actually been to Liverpool. I've only been to Manchester once even, and that was when I was a baby. I don't remember it, but I've been to Durham quite a bit, obviously, because my family come from there. But no, I've not been to um, Liverpool. <laughs> Sorry, just looking at the chat for a sec. Right. So, yeah, I'll start to read this out now. So we've got something to talk about. Hey. <laughs> right, so this is... When they first start talking to the private detective, this is the private detective. Right, are you Larry J. Larson? Yes. And the J stands for what? John. Your address is what? In California. Is it all right if I give the business address? The business address will do very well. 815 East Moats Avenue, Orange. That's the city, city of Orange, California. Two, or about three years ago, did you see a member of the process, a young woman called Susan Dubins? Yes, I did. Can you tell my lord when that was? My lord is the judge, by the way, they say in British courts. That was roughly January 1971. She is a young woman. Uh, you may have been in court this morning. Uh, she may have been in court this morning, who also has the name Sister Belinda. Do you know of that name? Yes, I did. Where was it that you saw Miss Dubins? At her apartment in Hollywood. When you saw her, uh, you may have discussed a number of other matters, but did she make some request to you about a document? Yes, she did. Perhaps you will tell my lord and the jury what, this was, what that was. She said that Charles Manson had written an article about death and that the process wanted that article for their forthcoming issue called death. She wanted to know if I or Mr Paul Fitzgerald could assist in getting or smuggling it out. The Justice Melford, Melford Stevenson says, uh, Mr. Paul Fitzgerald, who is he? He was a defence attorney in the Manson case, defending Patricia Cromwinkle. Smuggling what? A. The article that Charles Manson had written on death. Out of where? Out of the jail that he was in. Mr. Neal, why did you say that? I said, I didn't think it would be possible. Uh, what did you say to that? Sorry. I said, I didn't think it would be possible, uh, but that I would ask a question about it. You mean you would ask somebody about it? Yes. But did you not think it would be possible? That is correct. Did Miss Dubin say what she knew about the article, whether she had any contact herself with Mr Manson or not? <coughs> she said she'd either tried to visit or had visited Charles Manson about one month prior to my visit. I think she said she was successful in seeing him briefly. I do not think we've heard this yet, but in January 1971, what stage had the Manson proceedings reach, reached? Was it at the trial or after the trial, or how? This was, I believe, just at the conclusion of the guilt or innocence phase, and I don't believe that the penalty phase had yet started, although it may have. It was just about that time. The procedure in California is that you have criminal proceedings split into two pieces. First of all, you have the decision as to guilt or innocence, then subsequent to that, the hearing before the jury with regard to what penalty is to be. Yes, in almost all cases, and we don't do that in the UK, that's why he's asking that. And in this case, you think it was the interval between those two procedures, either at the very end of the guilt or innocence phase or at the very start of the penalty phase. Apart from visiting Charles Manson, you think about a month before this event, did she say anything else about any contact she had with the trial or anyone attending the trial? She said she was in trial almost every day. Mr Justice Milford Stevenson. Meaning in the court, at yes. Uh, answer, yes, attending the trial. Mr Neal. Did she indicate uh, when she was attending the trial, whereabout she was sitting? It would be in the public section of the courtroom, sitting in the public section, uh, but she didn't give any indication as to anyone she was sitting with or near to or anything like that. She seemed to know a number of the Manson family girls. 
and then he's cross-examined by Mr. Kempster. I may have missed it, but are, are you an attorney? No, I am not. What had you to do with the trial of Charles Manson? Uh, at that point, I was assisting Paul Fitzgerald in some of the investigations on the case. Are you a private investigator then? Yes, I am. So you were a private investigator acting on behalf of the defence of Charles Manson. Is that right? Not Charles Manson. Of which? Uh, Patricia Cromwinkle. She was a member of the family with a big F, was she? Yes. Did Miss Dubins arrange to come and see you? No. Did you make an appointment to see her then? Yes. Having made an appointment to see her, she asked you if you could help to get the article by Charles Manson out of jail for the process church? Yes. Following her request, did you make any attempts to get this article out? No, I didn't. So you did not do anything? No, I didn't take it serious. A quite different topic. I do not know whether you know the answer to this as a private investigator, but was pornographic material freely available for sale in California in these times? It would have to depend on your definition of pornographic material. Shall I say dirty books and magazines? Uh, that will suffice for my purpose, if that conveys anything for you. The laws have changed so rapidly in California, it depends on which year you're talking about. I see. Are there any years you can remember when dirty books and magazines were not available in California? I am not asking you about the law. I am asking you about their availability. Publicly or privately? Readily acceptable. The real change in the law took place. I'm not asking you about that. I'm not asking you about the law at all. I'm just asking you if there was any time you can remember when dirty books and magazines were not freely available in California. Yes. How long ago? That was about the turning point, 1970, 1971. When you say a turning point, from what to what? There were many changes in the case law of the United States Constitution, United States Supreme Court. May I put my question again? I am asking you whether you could remember any year when dirty books and magazines were not available in California. You first said readily available. Mr. Kempster, all right, readily available. Mr. Justice Melford Stevenson, I imagine that if somebody wants to buy a dirty book in California, they have always been able to do it, have they not? Yes. Mr. Justice Melford Stevenson, of course. Mr. Kempster, I'm obliged to your lordship. Mr. Neal, thank you, Mr. Larson. The witness withdrew. So that was weird as hell because I don't understand why he started asking him all that stuff about uh, dirty books and pornography. Why did he suddenly mention that? Because no one had brought that up. That was just very weird. But basically, that's the main, the most interesting thing Mr. Larson says. And this is the private detective. And they're talking about being um, asked to smuggle an article out of the prison by the process church. And the Process Church did publish an article uh, in their death magazine written by Charles Manson, didn't they? So that did happen. But yeah. Sorry, just let me look at the chat for a second. Let's say this private detective is saying he was employed by uh, Paul Fitzgerald at this point. But he was also employed by Ed Sanders. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, you were on Stone of Van Houten's show last night, were you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, God. I'm trying to scroll up through the flat. Is it, the chat is a nightmare. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, my lord. Also, there's some of that he might have been talking to the other lawyer when he said my lord as well. Because, yeah, they say your honour, but I'm pretty sure my lord, when they say my lord, they mean the judge. Might be the other bloody lawyer, though. I don't know. Because there were two lawyers both talking about him, both talking to him, weren't they? Yeah. <laughs> you waited another ten minutes and thought, fuck it, and left. God knows what it was all about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so he just started playing records for 90 minutes. Yeah. The mob were controlling the porn, but I don't understand where he was going with the porn stuff because yeah, that doesn't go any that doesn't go anywhere as well. If you read the rest of the document, they never talk about that again. I don't know why he decided to bring that up. What that had to do with anything. Basically, and that's it. And then the next significant thing that happens. 
is when Paul Fitzgerald is talking about um, the defense attorney, uh, the, the private detective. Sorry, he's the defense attorney, and he's talking about the. There you go. Right. I'll go back up here, yeah, because it's a. Uh... You'll go from where he gets cross examined. It. Oh, no, I'll read the old thing because this is quite funny. Yeah. Mr. Paul Fitzgerald recalled examination in chief by Mr. Neil. Continued. Do you remember that last night you were giving the list of the aspects of the Manson philosophy and the process teaching? Uh, where were you suggesting there was a similarity? Uh, were you suggesting there was a similarity? Yes. No, right. Sorry. No, I've come in at the wrong place. Right, yeah, just the, the cross-examination here. Did you know Ed Sanders well? I would say I came to know him well. Before I would say January of 1970, I did not know him well. You got to know him well. I did. Were you a collaborator in writing this book? No. Did you receive any proportion of the royalties from it? None whatever. Did, did Mr. Sanders Mr. Sanders' researcher, Mr. Larson, was apparently employed by you in connection with this case? That is correct. Who paid him? I paid him. Did Mr. Sanders pay him too? I have no personal knowledge of that, but that was my understanding. So that he was working, as it were, contrary to scripture for two masters. Correct. There was an agreement that materials obtained and information obtained on behalf of Mr. Sanders, was, Sanders would be made available to me. Did you get to know in your discussion with Mr. Sanders that one of the big points of the book he was writing was the idea that there was a connection between the family and the process church? Yes. Were you rewarded, if not financially, for your pains by the dedication in the front of the book for my friend Paul Fitzgerald? Quite the contrary. It caused me some considerable embarrassment. Mr Justice Melford Stevenson. I had not con I had I had not noticed that. I see. Did you get an autograph copy? I did. Mr Kempster. Would it be fair to say at this time you were coincidentally conducting the defence of Miss Cremwinkle and assisting Mr Sanders? You were doing your best to find every nasty bit of material about the process you could possibly find. No, I don't think that's correct. How would you express it? The connection between Manson and the process was more of an interest of Mr Sanders than it was to me. I had no extra ground with the respect to the process. That was really a preoccupation of Mr Sanders, not mine. Mr Justice Melford Stevenson. I suppose it was all material which, from your point of view, was potentially useful in mitigation. Yes, and also useful in establishing the mental state of Manson and the other members of the group, with a view towards diminished capacity and possible sanity. Uh, when you engage in a task, when you are engaged in a task of that kind, it is sometimes surprising, is it not, to find what psychologists can sweep up? It is, Mr. Kempster. I think you know or got to know. Uh, Mr. Sanders was a poet, did you not? Yes, I did. Are you familiar with any of his poetry? Very little. Yeah, and that's it. Yeah, there's no more that's relevant now. So basically, though frustratingly, he doesn't tell you what his interest was. He tells you his interest in what the private detective was finding was not the process church stuff. And I've heard rumours that he was actually interested in, I can't find a source for this, a positive like document showing this, that he was interested in J.C. Brings drug dealing connections, and this private detective also found out stuff about that, and that's what he was interested in. So he wasn't interested in the process church stuff, and he and he says stuff uh, to the newspapers, doesn't he, during her trial in the articles that I read out. He says stuff about she, though her fingerprint was found, that doesn't mean that she was there that night. She could have been there a year before, so that suggests he knew something about them having been there before, doesn't it as well? So, yeah, that's the reason I was interested to read that out was it's confirmation, true confirmation, because the, the lawyer testifies it in court that he had hired a private detective. So why were these lawyers hiring private detectives for their client? And he also says at one point as well that he uh, uh, left and went into private practice to continue uh, being Patricia Cranwinkle's lawyer. Mm -hmm. So he went to special measures to keep being her lawyer as well. So something obviously interested him. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's it. Well, everything did. And there was uh, there's early uh, newspaper articles about Frakowski's drug dealing connections, that, and but none of that's ever mentioned in court, you know. And Reeve Whitson was apparently meant to testify, but never did in the end, and shit like that. And I don't think, um, and also the guy who wrote the Yann of the Witch article, the famous Yann of the Witch article, uh, he uh, got to court but never testified. He was never called to testify in the end. But he was going to testify, which would have been about Linda Kasabian, obviously. But he never did. And her husband, because there's photos of her husband, Bob Kasabian, and the bloke who wrote the Yann of the Witch article walking in and out of the court. But they didn't ever testify. So yeah, there's all sorts of shit. Oh no, is your internet dying? Right, I'll probably have a, a drink for myself, I think. Yeah, like I say, these are the more casual streams. Got 36 people here, though. Thanks for coming, everyone. Like I say, the actual 1,000 subscriber special is going to be on <coughs> Sunday night. And it is some interesting stuff about the Grateful Dead. And there's something that's, qu well, quite a funny and ridiculous theory about them, I hope. I think there's probably a few people in my chat will think it might be real. But no, this is obviously just someone trolling quite funny and there's a recording that goes with it and if I can find the recording maybe on the after show we'll listen to the recording but yeah so it should be quite a good stream for my thousand subscriber special and the biggest thing on the Grateful Dead is everyone blames them for Altamont as well basically that's like the verdict nowadays the modern verdict is it was all the Grateful Dead's fault but I think that's a bit unfair <coughs> because the chapter of the Hells Angels that they recommended had been good at crowd control and they had done crowd control for Jefferson Airplane, and it had worked out well. But they had to use a different chapter of the Hells Angels, uh, Altamont, in the end, because of un unpredictable circumstances. So you can't really blame the Grateful Dead. But yeah, I'll get to that when I'm doing the stream about the Grateful Dead, obviously. Nancy would rather have a bottle in front of her than... I don't know. Charles Watson. Oh god, let's see. Um my tonic water. The stones, yeah, the stones is Altamont. Yeah, yeah, that's the stones. But uh the Grateful Dead recommended they use the Hells Angels as security because they had used the chapter that was, you know, in their bit of California and it had worked out well at Grateful Dead gigs and uh Jefferson Airplane gigs with this particular chapter of the Hells Angels. Angels, so they were used to doing crowd control and were experienced at it. Uh, but because the site got moved, motorcycle gangs are really territorial, and uh, like you cannot, like, uh, and so where the site got moved, uh, at the last minute, that chapter of the Hells Angels could no longer do the security there, so the chapter of the Hells Angels for that area had to do it, and those guys were not experienced at doing crowd control. And it was really badly managed. The stage was really dangerous. It must have been terrifying for them. I don't want to demonize them either because I feel sorry for them. I'm not surprised they freaked out when a guy started wave waving a gun around. It was tragic for everyone, you know. And they were um, on this terrible acid and loads of wine and speed and shit, you know. So, God, yeah, I don't want to like make it sound, you know. It was just tragic for everyone. It was just a ridiculous sequence of events, you know. Yeah. Yeah, you blame the Grateful Dead for interminable rambling guitar noodling songs. Yeah, yeah. Songs where nothing fucking happens. Ah, oh, because there's, well, there's music, there's music like that where there's no words and long instrumentals. If you want, if you like that sort of shit, Frank Zappa is the guy to go to. Fucking hell. The guy, I, I don't, I've never really got into the Grateful Dead. But I like Frank, but Frank Zappa was actually a shit hot musician as well, wasn't he? That was the thing. But were the Grateful Dead really? I, I don't hear them praised so much like as virtuoso musicians as guys like Zappa were, you know. I got my swear. Oh, thank you. This is actually my bloody dressing gown. I was going to apologize. I'm in my dressing gown, but no, oh, do people like it? Yeah, yeah, no, this is actually my dressing gown and my pajamas. <coughs> Just trying to relax in the evening. I was going to put a, a top on and everything. Well, it'll be my thousand subscriber special uh, on Sunday, and because uh, we was going to talk more about Crumwinkle on this special, on this stream, I've got some clips of her to watch, which is the first time we ever see her speak, like ever. Literally, there's no recordings of her voice from the, the, around the time of the trial or the seventies or anything. You don't hear her speak until 1996. 
first time she ever speaks. Hmm. Oh yeah, Zappa is a uh, really, really. Oh, sorry, sorry, hit the wrong comment. Chat was moving. Yeah, he did. He had a lot of contempt for the whole, the whole music scene in general and drug use. He's such an interesting bloke because it's weird that he made music that was so appealing to people that did drugs, but he was uh, really anti-drugs. Makes you wonder why he did that, doesn't it? And that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I, I, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll find it in a minute. I'll find it and read what he says. Because uh, the, the, the lawyer asked him, the lawyer says, because he started out as a public defender, but then he suddenly went and took her on privately. He took her on not as a public defender. Yeah, so who was paying for it? Yeah, that, that is a good point. Who the fuck was paying for it? Yeah, yeah. Because I don't think her parents did. I don't think he, he says. Her parent, well, he obviously didn't say, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Nancy, after, oh, it's always after die. It's actually midnight when I'm going live, yeah, <laughs> where I am. Oh, and it's a leap year, isn't it? I should mention that. It's the 29th of February, still where you are, isn't it? It's now the 1st of March here, but where you are. This is like a really rare day, and it? it only happens every four years if you're still on the 29th of February. Never mentioned that, did I? Mm. Yes, that's the thing, little Milky. He was. He was not kind of square. He was. That's the really interesting thing about Zappa. It's like really strange. Why did he make music that was so appealing to people that like drugs when he himself was so anti-drugs? It's weird, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Did they have Discovery then? I don't. Did they have Discovery in 1969? I don't think they did. All of what Larson found out came from the LAPD files. He would have access to them via Fitzgerald. He would have received all prosecution materials via Discovery. Yeah, it was Sonny Bono went on to be a uh, senator, didn't he? And then he died under weird circumstances, didn't he? Yeah. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there, there is. It's, it's not him. You no, know, if you, if you're looking for the CIA person in that family, it's his wife. It's his wife, Gail. No, it's Gail. I reckon it was Gail personally. That's who my money's on. And uh, they they killed they they use this word handler don't they but I think they, yeah she she was she was keeping him under control somehow because his dad his only military connection was he served in World War Two like everyone else's dad in those fucking days when he worked at Edgewood Arsenal he, it was as a chemist it wasn't as a soldier for the military it was as a chemist on behalf of the military and this happens a lot um, my ex's dad was an electrician for the military. And I've went out with blokes who work in the naval bases at Portsmouth and they are not soldiers, but they've signed the Official Secrets Act. They have a card that they show you that says they've signed the Official Secrets Act. Trying to get laid sort of thing. But no, it's not because they're soldiers. It's just because they work on a military base. Yeah. And so Frank, Frank Zappa's dad was employed on that sort of basis. He wasn't actually a soldier. Be interesting to know exactly what he did and what, well, we could probably find the years quite accurately that he was there. But it would have obviously been early, wouldn't it? In the what fucking fifties? I don't think how old Frank Zappa was, because I'm I'm thinking of him as the same age as my parents, but I think he was slightly older than my parents. So I think it would have been like what, like when Frank Zappa was a teenager, it would have been the fifties. Don't know. Who knows? We'll work it out. And I'll give you a presentation. But he certainly said some interesting stuff in interviews about the military industrial complex. And uh, the music industry that shows that he knew some shit and he was trying to tell us something. And there are songs, the song lyrics that he did that, that he's trying to tell us something. And I think he was trying to tell us something. <laughs> Definitely the whole time he was somehow being forced to do what he was doing. That's my feeling about him. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> there was always a lot of discharge semen around the naval base. Yeah, yeah. We live on the Isle of Wight, just across the water from the naval base here. Hmm. Yeah, he worked at the Edgewood Arsenal. Frank Zappa's dad worked at the Edgewood Arsenal, which is a fucking the thing that makes everyone go, oh my god. But no, if you look into it, his dad wasn't actually a, a military person there. He was just a chemist hired by them. So he worked for the military. 
Yeah. Yeah, he did a lot politically as well. He was an ambassador. He became an ambassador for um oh uh, the Middle East uh, middle, uh, at one point in that, didn't he? He did all sorts. And he spoke up in court, him and Dee Snyder both spoke up in a court hearing about lyrics, song lyrics, didn't they? And that and you know, uh, whether they should change the laws and all that sort of shit. He did a lot. Oh my cat's having a coffin fit. Can you hear him? Oh, he's all right, don't worry. Oh, well, wow. I've got to find that. I'd like to find that. Because he did play with love, didn't he? Yeah. And he talks about, yeah. Bobby basically flipping out. I've got to do more streams about Bobby. Because people aren't aware of Bobby. And uh, everyone just thinks they were influenced by Charles Manson. They don't realise that these girls... Well, if you look at the, what they said in the penalty phase. That's it. Oh, he's so he's curled up so cute, but I can't. I'd have to tilt the laptop to show to show you. No, they curl up with their. Chin. He likes being scratched under the chin as well. That's it. Oh, you love that, don't you? Yes. Yeah, chemical weapons. Well, that could, that might be what he's testing. I've never been able to get he confirmed exactly what his dad did work on. The only thing Frank Zappa talked about extensively in interviews was that his dad brought home loads of mercury. Uh, but this this as well isn't that weird because my dad says that in the 50s and 60s they didn't know that mercury caused cancer and they did give it to children because he was given it in chemistry and he said he remembered dripping it on the desk and they were poking it with their fingers. They thought it was safe at this point. But Frank Zappa talks about, their, about um, being uh, given huge amounts of it by his dad. His dad just used to bring home whole buckets of it for him to play with. And he used to hit it with a hammer. You know what mercury is? It's like a liquid in it. And when you poke it, it, but it's not safe to touch. You can't touch it. It gives you cancer. But they didn't know this until I think they found it out in the 70s or 80s. And now children aren't allowed to play with it. But yeah, if you, if you just take that in isolation, it sounds weird that Frank Zappa's dad gave him this cancerous thing to play with. But back then they didn't know it caused cancer. They, they, they did give it to kids to play with. And if you bought chemistry sets, you got small amounts of it. But it sounds like because his dad was a chemist, his dad had large amounts of it. And his dad used to bring him home ridiculous amounts of mercury to play with, like whole buckets of it. And he said he would hit it with a hammer and it would splash all over his bedroom and stuff like that. You know what I mean? So it's no, And he did eventually die of prostate cancer as well. And that is one of the things that it can cause. But no, I don't believe that was done deliberately, uh, fucking that they planned for him to die or anything like that. I think it was purely just because at the time they didn't know that it caused cancer. Yeah. Yeah, it was used in thermometers for years. It was used in thermometers. Yeah, and he did die from cancer. He died of uh, prostate cancer, yeah. And that is one of the things that can be caused. And there's his final interviews. If you find his final interviews as well, he was pissed off because he was going to the doctors for years and they refused to believe anything was wrong. And they tried to, like, um, dismiss his symptoms. Hmm. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, kids used to run through the fields uh, uh, behind planes spraying DDT. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Too much yellow snow. Do you guys know the song You Are What You Is? There's a reference to weird military experiments in that song. They sing, and a cow don't make ham. And the guy says, I know they's working on it underneath Virginia. Do you know that song? No. <laughs> But yeah, the idea there's some kind of military base underneath Virginia where they're trying to make a cow make ham. Yeah, and that's it. And now all the frogs are gay. Underneath Virginia. Hmm. Yeah, nowadays the mercury's just in our vaccines. Nice, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. That's it, yeah. So we show the other day an interview with I think Atkins lawyer as a really old guy. He said had Manson had a better lawyer, he would have got a fault. And many, many people say it. Yeah, the case against Manson was so circumstantial, and honestly, it was it was ridiculous. Well, the whole thing it should have just been declared a mistrial at so many points. It was just ridiculous. Huh. Cool, I might just take a break for a second instead of like going to an after stream because I want to go to the Patricia Cromwinkle. 
clips because this is like crazy. It's the uh, the first time you hear her voice ever. Like literally, there is no footage of her ever. You can't find the transcript of her, what she said in the penalty phase. No police interviews have ever leaked. And the first time she ever speaks is 1996, 25 years after the murders. Yeah. Yeah. No, exactly the same. I think it pretty much is, though. I think it would still... Uh, and it's not in thermometers anymore. They use something else in thermometers now. It's not. But yeah, there used to be like literal mer mercury in thermometers, didn't they? Yeah. Oh, oh, you mean in vaccines? In vaccines, not the same kind of mercury. Yeah. Sorry, I thought you were talking about thermometers in the vaccines, yeah. No, yeah, I'm just glad. I had mine when I was a baby when they gave you separate vaccines for measles, mumps and rubella. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to take a break for a second. And I'll come back and we'll watch these clips. We'll edit this out. Yeah, everyone. Going to do what you need to be. It'll be about five, well, probably not even five minutes, about two minutes. Right, sorry about that. Yeah. Uh... Right, is the mic working again? Let me know if you can't hear me. There you go. Yeah, sorry about that. Just need to take a break for a second. Oh, and you got a good view of the cat there for a minute, didn't you? I think while we were stood up. Mmm. In Virginia, is that where is Edward Arsenal in Virginia? Are you kidding me? Oh my god, that is so fucking strange, right? No, that, seriously, there's a Frank Zappa song called um, "You Are What You Is," right? And that is that is actually a lyric in it. It's like a backing vocal bit. The guy goes, uh, "And a cow, the, the the lyric is the cow, a cow don't make ham." And the guy says, "I know that he's working on it underneath Virginia." Shit, that's mental. Yeah, oh, you saw his tail, did you? Oh, that's all right then. Yeah, but and so Frank Zappa wrote that lyric as well. See, he was trying to tell us something, guys. 
He was trying to tell us. What was he saying? But no, honestly, there's his mental things there. Yeah, black cat, yeah. He's black and white. He's not he's not all black. The black one ran away. Sorry, just looking at the chat for a minute there. Looked like it looked like yeah, some kind of MK Ultra triggering triggering, didn't it? Talked about the black cat and I went Oh no, MK Ultra glitch. No, it's alright, yeah. Hi there. Oh, and hello. You're new, aren't you? Haven't seen you before. How are you doing? Excellent. Are you a subscriber? I hope so. I'm over a thousand subscribers now. That's crazy. Oh, yes. And I'm, we're about to start watching these clips because it's interesting, obviously, because uh, it's meant to be about Kremlinkle, isn't it? And yeah, just to tell you something about my life as well, <coughs> I can see what this show is because I did work experience for a very, very local small TV station when I was, um, what, in my early 20s? And uh, I can see what this show is. Uh, these TV stations, they buy American shows, uh, but they've bought them just to use the clips. So they buy the show and they cut out the presenters and the presenters' voiceovers and they just use the clips and they insert their own presenter and their own voiceovers. And that's what this is. So if we look, we could probably find the American version of this show. But it's the footage of her 1996 parole hearing, basically. And I can see that that's, this is what BBC Two have done, basically. Yeah. Where is it? Scroll it back. And yeah, I'm going to skip through some bits. It's not to be uh, mean, but if you're here, you probably already know the details of the crimes and uh, the way the British, the, what they've spliced over it, describes it is quite uh, clunky and awful anyway. Uh, they call Lino LaBianca Leon LaBianca and shit like that. So, yeah, it is quite painful. But I can see that that's what this show is. They've Basically, they've taken an American show and all they're paying for is the right to show the clips and they're allowed to edit out their presenter and that's what they've done. So we could probably find the American version of this if we looked. Oh, and there's a nice flashback for you. Look, if, you're, if you're English, this is the, the BBC 2 logo in uh, 1996. I'm going to sc scroll through parts of this, and it's not to be insensitive. It's just because we're just talking about Patricia Cranwinkle tonight. If you want to watch the whole thing, watch the whole thing. Some tough Remember that? questions to be faced now on BBC Two in this week's case from Court TV. Do we believe in forgiveness? Do we believe in mercy? Do we believe in justice? I think their crimes are bad enough that, yes, they should stay in prison for the rest of their lives. I've been here 25 years. Well, of course, I would love to be free. Just to avoid issues, I need to be on the screen. There, um, any time, I mean, I, all I have to do is look at fences and wires and but know that there's a whole enough. world beyond this. Ever. I was 21 when I came into prison. It was an important day for Patricia Krenwinkel. Right, and I'm going to go ahead prison she was going before the parole board to have a TV company spliced over whatever your TV company said. But just for the sake of it, I'm, oh, I'm going to get to her, um, where she's talking. Sorry, I'm going to get to her about there. Um, as I understand a statement of facts on uh, August 9th, 1969, prisoner in the company of uh, crime partners, uh, Charles Watson, uh, Linda Kasabian, and Susan Atkins drove to uh, Nazareth on Seattle Drive in Los Angeles. Uh, and thereafter, uh, as a result of their actions, five uh, individuals were murdered. Uh, uh, at that time, the prisoner was armed with a knife, and uh, crime partner Watson was armed with a 22 caliber revolver. Um, prior to yeah, the residence, I mean, yeah, uh, the dogs like, I think the dogs know us. 
and then uh, the prison and crime partners uh, climbed over a wall and uh, entered the uh, property. At that time, uh, victim number three, Steve Parent, apparently was leaving the property. He was confronted by uh, uh, Watson and uh, was shot four times. And then the prisoner crime partners went into the residence, and uh, the uh, victim in count two, uh, Frankowski, who was asleep on the couch. Uh, the victim in count four, Tate, was, who was eight months pregnant, was in her bedroom, uh, talking with uh, the victim in count number five, J.C. Uh, the victim in count one, Abigail Folger, was in her bedroom. The victims were taken into the living room portion of the uh, residence where uh, the victim, Sebring, attempted to escape and was shot by crime partner Watson. And uh, after that... Uh, no, just to talk to the chat for a second, because, yeah, they, they're just going through the crime, aren't they? Yeah, just answer your questions for a second there. Yeah, well, this is it. It's so sad because uh, from what I'm hearing now, because I thought Patricia was the older one, but I think Deborah was actually, the, like, I know Sharon was the oldest sister, but she was 11, it says, when, when Sharon died. And so Deborah's actually slightly older than Patricia, yeah. Yeah, it's horrible. Do I think she would ever get paroled? Well, if Leslie got paroled, maybe she's got a chance, I think. Yeah, maybe, but probably not, probably not. To be quite honest, on my opinion on whether I think that's right as well would probably be unpopular. So I think, yeah. yeah. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Jane Fonda also worked with dogs, but we won't talk about that. That's libelous. Yeah. Oh wow. Well. You grew up over a decommissioned Nike missile, missile launch site. There are tunnels and a large bunker, bunker under my childhood home and neighbourhood. Wow. Yeah, because, well, the Isle of Wight has got a few weird forts, but this was all just built during World War II, and the funniest thing was they built them on the wrong side of the island too. I could go into this one night if people want to hear about the Isle of Wight, because this channel is also about social history too, and it is, yeah. But we've got major fortification along the seafront of Ride on the Isle of Wight, but that actually faces Portsmouth, which is not our enemy. So, like, the Germans wouldn't have been coming at us from Portsmouth. They'd have been coming at us from the other way. So it's, like, kind of ridiculous that we built all these fortification on one side of the island. It's kind of a joke. <laughs> Sorry, let me look at the chat again. What were we saying? Because we haven't even got to the point where she started talking yet, haven't we? I just wanted to address a couple of things that we're saying. You don't think any of them should have got out. And yeah, and of course, just our oh, gut feeling when you hear it is, of course, no, for what these people did, none of them should have. But you look at the legal ramifications of it as well, because I've done, I've got a psychology degree and I was interested. I've never been a parole officer, but I was interested in the, the justice system. And but basically, for they, when you're going to work in any of these systems, uh, basically, they don't just check your criminal record, they check your known associates. And so, like, because of who my known associates are, it's like a difficult, difficult situation, and I could never work in prisons or anything like that, basically, because of my past. It's sad. Yeah, well, she's dead now, isn't she? But yeah, now it's uh, Deborah that turns up, isn't it? Patricia, Patricia used to turn up, but now Patricia's dead, and now it's Deborah, isn't it, that turns up here? Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and they said, yeah, Charlie told Cromwinkle she was ugly after their first encounter, and she says in court that he only slept with her four or five times in all the years they was together, because she was one of the first Manson girls. She was the third one to join him. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. They should be happy to stay in jail, and they're safer in jail. But fucking, who would find them nowadays? They'll, they'll, they'll hide them, won't they? Yeah. They are safer. They are probably safer in jail. But no, my opinion on the 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 whole troll, I think they will. I'm not even going to state my opinion until I can present a whole bloody case for it. But I just think no, this whole this whole case was wrong, and it was because of a cover up. And I think that the people who perpetrated it felt guilty, and they set it up hoping that these people's convictions would get overturned in a couple of years' time. But they, they was just paid to do a cover-up, basically. 
but it never worked out because the crimes were so horrific, people could not deal with them being released. So they've just been kept in prison all this time. But if these these crimes weren't notorious, very weren't so notorious, these people would have been let out years ago. Similar things happen all the time, and the people get released. Probably more so where I come from than where you are. <laughs> but, but yeah, fucking people get released all the time for doing less than, well, more than these people actually did, you know. It is strange. But yeah, let's carry on watching because we, let's get to where she starts talking because she says something interesting. Mm -hmm. It was, uh, I guess, a lot of confusion. Uh, people uh, running around, is that correct? Mm, yes. And uh, that, uh, thereafter, uh, the other victims were uh, attacked and killed. And uh, the uh, one victim told her around the back door and she was pursued by you, is that correct? Yes, that's true. And uh, you stabbed her several times? Yes, I did. Has she made it out to the yard itself? Yes, she did. And what was she doing? She was running. She was fleeing. Okay. Was she clothed or? Yes. And how did you catch up to her? What happened when you caught up to her? I stabbed her. In the back? Yes. She around. Did she fall immediately? Yes. Okay. How many times did you stab her? I have no idea. It says that uh, in total, uh, the victims at that uh, location suffered uh, approximately 102 oh, stabs. Did something. you stab any of the other victims? No, I did not. How about uh, Frykowski? No. Did, did you not. do anything to Frykowski? No, I did not. Did you assist in tying him up? Or? No, I did not. Okay. How about um, Tate? No, I did not. Did you contact Tate? No, I did not. We may come back to this area. Uh, one of the other commissioners might have some questions about the life crimes. Uh, right now, I'm going to go into the other. Because they're mental, they have to quite be. Uh, the so will wrong. then turn their attention to Krenwinkel's background. They wanted to know whether she had a criminal record before the killings and to ask her about her history of drug use. First, they reviewed her family background. No, that's, that's fine. Okay. Uh, you were born in Los Angeles, yeah. right? And your parents separated when you were about 14 or 15. And uh, your sister, uh, you had a, uh, one sister named Charlene Mann who was uh, older than you and ultimately uh, she became addicted to drugs and she died uh, when she was about 29 years old. Is that correct? Yeah. You lived primarily with your mother? Yeah. At a later pro hearing, they say and, she uh, died you in Rome. Did from high school? Yes, from did. University High? Yes. We're going to watch that and, tonight. Uh, watch then, it night. In general, you were on the road after a period of time. I uh, that she died after uh, the night. Ultimately, uh, you, had, you held several different jobs. Um, and at some point in time, you uh, quit the jobs and you know, ended up joining up with the Manson family. And I know that's kind of a synopsis of your life prior to your incarceration, but um, and the other commissioners may want to ask some questions about that later on. In terms of your prior record, I know that you were arrested for possession of dangerous drugs in Ukiah. That was dismissed. Yes, it was. Did you know that uh, you started taking uh, uh, drugs when you were about 14 or 15? I assume those were prescription drugs at that time due to your having been overweight. And doctor prescribed some benzatrine? Yes, that's okay. right. And uh, ultimately, uh, uh, you started using illegal drugs. Yes. And uh, uh, you used uh, marijuana, reds, whites, uh, acid. Uh, alcohol. Alcohol. Uh, and other uh, marijuana derivatives, uh, peyote and things like that. There was some indication that uh, as a result of having used the uh, LSD that you had uh, taken, with, quote, quite a few trips. Approximately 250 to 500. 250 to 500. You said less in court, according to the newspaper. And you've remained in this institution since then. Your classification is zero, and you've never had any disciplinary crimes. Is that correct? That's correct. But that's uh, pretty remarkable no, that you haven't had any disciplinary debts. I'm going to pause it for a sec, yeah, because it stops copyright claims, but yeah. We'll come back to it in a minute, but it's interesting, isn't it, to hear? Which, well, we'll get to the bit where she starts crying, and I'll comment on that. 
later. But um, this seems to be, and they get to a bit later where they're saying she's you've come on a long way in the last couple of years, last two years. And uh, <clears throat> I think this woman was just completely shattered by what happened, basically, obviously, and what she did. And it took her a long, long time to come to terms with what had happened. And so it literally took 25 years. And this is like literally the first time she's starting to really show any remorse or anything. And this is why they've wheeled her out and let, let, let us see her for the first time. You know what I mean? Because um, I think she was completely destroyed by it all. And I think they all were. And I don't think any of them were fit to stand trial. And they shouldn't have stood trial like they did. And it's sick that only Leslie got the second and third trials that she got it's sick it really is sick they all should have got the same thing charlie included they all should have got another trial that trial that they got was sick no other word for it it's disgusting and and i don't know that's horrible considering what they did and they are guilty of what they did i'm not saying they're not guilty but people deserve a fair trial no matter what and these people did not get a fair trial it's disgusting and it's not justice for the victims if it wasn't a fair trial as well. It's not only the fucking perpetrators that I'm sympathetic for. And I'm not that sympathetic for them because they did do it. I'm not trying to say that, you know. But no, it's sick. They they deserve fair trials. Everyone deserves a fair trial. And it's not justice if a fair trial isn't done, you know. <laughs> she looks like Bruce... Yeah, light in the mood for a second. Yeah, she does look a bit like Bruce Jenner, doesn't she? <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah that's it actually well she didn't stab sharon did she she was stabbing folger but the thing is well, linda kasabian if you work it out was actually pregnant this night as well she was pregnant as she was doing this and susan atkins had literally just had a baby uh looking at patricia cranwin called the endocrine disorder that they say she has that caused all the body hair it's probably pcos which probably means she was infertile. She was unable to have babies. That's why she never got pregnant. Basically, you know. And uh, it was, it's more difficult to have babies. Nowadays, they can find ways for you to have a bloody baby, can't they? But back when, in the 60s, she was probably infertile. That's why she never had any babies. But yeah, though, that's the other thing that really freaks me out about this, that I hate about this, is that Susan Atkins had had a baby less than a year before. So had Linda Kasabian. Linda Kasabian had a baby. Well, the, her baby was nearly two, wasn't she? But she knew what it's like to be a pregnant woman and was pregnant on this night as well. If you if you uh, look into it, yeah. If you add the dates up, she was pregnant. And there's Sharon Tate there going, oh, please. Let me live for a week. She was begging them to let her live for a week so she could have the baby. Oh, it's evil, isn't it? They're just, And this is why, you know, it's so hard to accept, isn't it? Any... Oh, I've thought of them being released. Hmm. If only you drove to the city, they would drive house in the June of 1990. Back then, there was no gate up on the driveway. You are able to drive right in. You cannot see the house from the driveway and garage. So, 1990, the original house was still there then, wasn't it? When was the original house knocked down? Yeah. A new interview she did said that Tex told her to go back to the house and check if anyone was there. She went there but realised she was exhausted and rested against the wall. She never checked. Do you mean the guest house? Do you mean the guest house? You must mean the guest house, don't you? Ah, so she was lying about having checked the guest house. She just said, yeah, I checked the guest house, but actually was just knackered and didn't. Because she was so tired from stabbing up. Oh, God. Yeah, it's horrible. It's horrible to think about. It really is. Yeah, yeah. Mm, I don't know where's where's uh, who knows this for sure though. Yeah, yeah. She told Tex to kill Sharon when he was contemplating it, but no, who knows that? Who knows that? Yeah, you meant the guest house, not yeah, yeah. Told her to go and check the guest house. Yeah, yeah. Ah, so she's now admitted she never checked the guest house. So maybe Garrettson was in there, and so we've got no reason to question whether there was back trials or not. Garrettson really was in there and just hid and shut himself when he realised people was getting murdered on the lawn outside and didn't go out, which is actually quite plausible, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And was too scared to say anything the next day. That's actually quite plausible. Oh, so that's good. So if Kremwinkle's actually admitting, go look for it. 
Yeah, I find all this, this sort of thing like who who bloody really knows who who was talking to Tex at the minute he did that and that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. I don't believe it. I think it's more likely it was Linda that told him to kill fucking Sharon. Hmm. But this is just speculation. We're just speculating now. Yeah, this is the other good point. If none of the victims have been rich or famous. I doubt the trial would have been such a, yeah, a publicity thing, isn't it? Yeah, or that anyone would remember it. Yeah, this is it. Well, they say this, don't they? If Sharon Tate hadn't been one of the victims, we wouldn't be talking about this now. And then that's the scary thing because this is a really, really twisted case. You know what I mean? But weird murders like this happen all the time. And like I say, uh, I just went digging just to prove this point, and I found some LSD-related murders that are well, like way more twisted than this that, that no one talks about. And it's just because no one famous happened. It happened in some town up the arsehole of nowhere in America, and it was so horrible they didn't want to report too much on it, so no one knows about it. But because Sharon Tate died, and JC bringing Abigail Folger, this 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 is suddenly a big deal you know what i mean this this is the facts of the matter it's sad isn't it really yeah well this is the rumor i've heard i cannot i've not seen a document that confirms that and when he's talking in court they don't say but this is what but he does confirm that his interest in what the private detective was finding was not the process church and we do know from newspaper articles at the time that he was saying, well, though you found Cromwinkle and Watson's uh, fingerprint, it does not mean that they were there that, that night. They could have been there a year before. So did he know something about them having been there before? Maybe. Well, Watson, at least, there is uh, actually, you know, it's almost verifiable that Watson actually stayed at the guest house of Cielo Drive before Tate and Polanski had rented it. But it actually was there. Oh, can you hear the foxes screaming? I doubt you can. There's foxes screaming outside. It's a really weird noise. Do you have? You, you do get foxes in America, don't you? Yeah. Like wild dogs. Hmm. Xbox murders. Yeah, well, the bloody hell yeah. There's the reasons that murders get bloody committed now are crazy. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Xbox doesn't even take drugs anymore. Yeah. But it's, it's it's just fucking crazy. Yeah. Ah, oh, the new house was built around 1999. It was recently on sale, different address, so it's no longer the same number of CLO Drive even. So how did they do that? They must have changed the lot number somehow or whatever, yeah. I know the house looks nothing like the original thing, and it's sad. It is sad because I can see what that house was meant to be. It was actually built, if you look into that house, it was built by a, a French actress. And it was meant to look like a chateau in France. And that's probably why Sharon Tate um, liked it so much. Because at, at some point in her dad's military career, they, they lived in France. And she did acting in France and that. And so she probably lived in a place like that. And she just loved the place. And that's the tragic thing. Because if she hadn't been so determined to stay at that house and had just gone to stay with her mates until... The weirdos cleared out she would have probably survived that is the most tragic thing about it but apparently she just really loved that house and she was being stubborn and she was like no why should i move out let them move out god look how much gin i've just poured myself guys that's terrible i'm a naughty person oh shit yeah let's listen to some more of the clip actually Dragging on for ages, isn't it? You know, but uh, that the what what did she say so far that was interesting? I don't remember. Can't remember. Let me play more. That's unusual. During her time in prison, Patricia Krenwinkle has been involved in a number of the voluntary <laughs> programs <laughs> on Terra. Excuse me. The inmates run their own firefighting unit at the prison, and the board asked her about That's her work okay. on physical training for the members of that unit. I notice you work now. You, you're a trainer, yes, uh, and you received exceptional work reports. What type of training are you doing? 
and a physical fitness training before, before the physical fitness training. training. We have three fire camps that are uh, two of them located in San Diego, one in Malibu. These women have to meet the fire requirement physical fitness tests in order to be able to go out and live at these camps and fight the fires as we just had all those massive fires. Uh, training right. women that can be really and the so it's yeah. it's a good job we have to teach them teamwork because we work as a team the focus is teamwork and physical fitness and um because it's, also uh, train the dogs, probably. it's one of the few programs here that of course training requires no physical fitness but you that didn't look like intense lesbian well actually together. Together. The and and the closely the little, woman behind her was uh, spotting her she was lifting the weights wow a good philosophy so about training, people yeah. you're working with because your life relies on those other people in a fire situation. You've been involved in the walkathons for child abuse yeah. prevention, and you're still and you have been active in the Read program, which is a tutoring program. Yes. Yeah, that that you say that. And so that is that a little different than the Yes I Can program? Oh, Yes I Can is um, that's a program that you help tutor people to get their GED. Read helps people to learn how to read. Most of the okay. skills are back from about fifth grade. Okay, so Most our readers are they're not, fifth grade education. I see, so they're not even close to getting their GED. No, they need which your is, to Right, we're just trying to develop word skills okay. and reading skills on a very basic level. And, and have you personally gotten a lot out of doing that? Oh, I've loved doing that. Think of the impact that it's she would lawyer. have on some of these young people where she can you know, talk about what happened to her as a young person as becoming so extremely involved in drugs and where all of this led to. And look at her sitting in this prison setting and, you know, being able to communicate with these young people on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So she's doing that too, and I think that... Yeah, and I just want to talk about this point that the lawyer is making here as well. Right, because Buddy... I used to think that there's no way it was getting back to them, but from what I'm hearing of Bruce Davis talking on that podcast and everything and some of the things Tex Watson said, I honestly think fucking somehow it gets back to them, what I'm saying in that. And, oh, God, this stuff about Patricia Cromwinkle and what she's saying there. Um, that's one thing I've always thought, if it gives a fucking any comfort at all, right? Just sitting in prison, being Patricia Cromwinkle. So, like, um, a woman who was, uh, like, by the letter of the law, it looks like she was pimped out by a man that drugged her and, you know, separated her from everyone. It was it narcissistic abuse, the bloody definition of narcissistic abuse? And uh, so, as a woman in prison, she can sit and say to young women, because uh, I've also read other things about the prisons that Patricia Kremwinkle's in and the the reuptake rate i forget the exact word for it sorry but that she's been in prisons where the women keep coming back and it's because they're working for methamphetamine pimp dealer mateys you know men that are p p pimping them out and or making them deal drugs or whatever and so a woman like patricia Cromwinkle in prison can sit there and say to these women look at me look what i got into i'm literally you know charles manson's bitch you know look what he did to me leave these men don't because she's talking to women that have a chance of getting out and so what the lawyer is saying here is really really relevant you know what i mean and if it gives anyone any fucking comfort even if you never get released uh, the work you did in prison to tell other women to leave these men is actually really really valuable it's a valuable thing that she's doing in prison because she's the best if seeing a woman like patricia Cromwinkle in prison saying look i wouldn't have and yeah, show, show, show them a picture of what you did to Abigail Folger as you're saying it. So look, I did this to this woman. And I'm not, and she's not a violent woman. That's the crazy thing about her. She's never committed a violent infraction in prison. She never did anything violent before. She just went out across two nights and committed these horrifically violent acts. And it was all for the love of some fucking narcissistic prick that abused her, basically. And she can see in prison and tell these women that saying don't let them do it to you don't go back to him if you get out fucking get away from them and that is powerful so she does have you know a good impact on people let's go back to what the lawyer was saying anyway that's um i think it's great i mean it's it's giving something back 
every time she volunteers, uh, she gets a, a chrono written up and put it in her file, which can be used to her benefit when she has a parole hearing. So it's it's not well, like she's doing this all for free, just out of the goodness of her heart. You know, she's no dummy. I mean, she's doing this because she's getting brownie points. Right, like, I do it for myself point. because it, it feels so good to be able to try to give something back to the community and to the people at large because I feel like it's it's necessary for me to feel like I that I'm able to do something that my life, I have to give it some kind of purpose. Next, the parole board had to decide whether Patricia Krenwinkel still... All right, let's pause for a minute. If I keep pausing, you can't copyright strike me. Yeah, that's it. Drugs get blamed for everything. <coughs> Poor drugs. Minute silence for drugs. They are but inanimate objects, yet they are blamed for everything. Yeah. She, yes, yeah, she was. Yes, yeah, she was. Uh, well, both. There was more than two. There was more than two. This is the point about the mountain case. They were not just two nights. That's the thing. They were not just two nights. Susan Atkins was at two as well. Just not the two you know about. That's the thing, you know what I mean? Well, not you personally, sorry. But I'm sure, yeah, if you're at this stream, you've probably heard about the other murders as well. But Susan Atkins was at the uh, Bobby Bosley murder. The, the, the Gary Hinman, the victim was a man named Gary Hinman. And he was probably murdered over bullshit. His masculine probably wasn't bad. The people that took it probably just didn't know how to take masculine and it made them vomit. And they thought that it was bad for that reason. And this guy was literally murdered over that bullshit. And this guy had let them stay on his lawn. He'd let them live in his, you know, he was really nice. It's, 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 you know, Bobby Beausoleil is a, as big a villain as Charles Manson. And he deserves more fucking scrutiny than he gets because he's another one. Like the light like text got away with being, oh, I was a robotic slave of Charles Manson. Well, Bobby Beausoleil, no one wants to talk about because if you bring up Bobby, then it shows Leslie and Susan's motive for, going and doing what they did. So it's all a load of bollocks. Eh? You scored a dope recipe they're all using at Cielo. It's in Peter Sellers' book you found today. So I bought Peter Sellers' son's book. I managed to confirm something just from looking at the pictures straight away. But yeah. A dope recipe. By, by dope recipe, what do you mean? It's a really good recipe for some kind of chicken casserole. Or it's a recipe for drugs in particular. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, Susan was a human as well. Yeah, yeah, Susan was. Sorry. Yeah, that's it. There was Hinman, Hinman was first. Well, Bernard Crow was shot first. And they apparently thought they killed him. But they hadn't killed him. He was still alive. And then, uh, then they kill him, and, and uh, they're freaking out. Bobby and Bobby doesn't get arrested for about six days, and then he gets arrested, and they're all freaking out because Bobby's arrested. And uh, also, there's been this situation with the people at Cielo Drive owe them money because of the MDA thing, and so they've gone up there and you know, they're, they're they're trying to get money for a lawyer for Bobby. And I don't believe that they went up there initially to kill everyone. And it was quite normal for the Manson family to go out armed with knives and shit like that. They they always had knives. And there's lots of t stories of Manson being sat in recording studios, twiddling knives on his knee. And people were he in the in the Manson file. Nicholas has interviewed one of the people that recorded Charles Manson, who talks about yeah he had a knife on his knee, and I just asked to look at the knife and cool, cooled him down over it sort of thing. You know, no one was actually bothered by it. But people were used to the Manson family carrying knives all the time. They did have knives. Yeah. So, yeah, she was always going to be in prison for decades. She could either sit around and vegetate or try and do something worthwhile and productive, and she did that. Yeah, and she has done that. And I think that the, the work she does is really, really good. 
And yeah, if there was one thing I could say to her, even if you never get out, at least imagine all the young women who have seen you and hopefully a few women heard you, you know what I mean, and did decide not to go back to the man that was uh, telling them to go out and do all this shit because she was in a fucking unusual situation where she got ordered to go out and do what she was ordered to do. Supposedly, you know, but um, fucking, but there's bad drug situations that land you in prison that are not quite as bad as what she did. You know what I mean? There's lots of sh shit that can land you in prison for a long time. And uh, I've read, yeah, she they were in prisons where the the rate of women being returned to prison was very high, whatever the bloody word for that is. And she works in workshops where she talks to these women. And uh, there's another documentary. I'll show you another night. Uh, but yeah, where well, she's older. It, but this is still ten years old. I see more recent stuff of her. But yeah, she's done er er everything she can. Like literally, yeah, there's not much she can do. More is there, and uh, I don't believe she'll ever get out. But having seen Leslie get out, fucking, I don't know now. Who knows? Maybe, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, well, it was, yeah, I feel bad she was obedient to a man. Well, it's such a weird thing, Linda, the whole situation. I've not gone into it so much. I did talk about that article, didn't I, where the, where the woman was trying to debate that that was a female journalist had written that. Why did these girls go out and stab strangers? But now we all know they weren't fucking strangers. They knew they had at least were acquainted with the addresses or something. They were not strangers. We were told that they went out and just murdered people they had never seen before in their lives, but. But yeah, that's it. But that she was so anxious to please this bloke. And I believe that this is why she acted as violently as she did. Because she was trying to get Charlie's attention in any way that she could, basically. And uh, he didn't give her the attention that she craved. And so she did just, and, and she wasn't even a violent woman. And this is the, and she did the, out of all of them, she did the most disturbing things. Didn't she? She was well. Um, the the injuries to I, I I never showed the photos on my streams. I just think it's in bad taste. I, well, well, no. I think that if a lot of people don't want to see that, if you want to see that, it's easy to Google, right? So I, that's why I don't show the pictures. I only show the crime scene, the, the, the diagram, the injury diagrams of where the injuries were. But Abigail, the photos of what was done to Abigail Folger almost disturbed me more than seeing the picture of Sharon Tate. I mean, obviously, the picture of Sharon Tate is disturbing because it's a dead pregnant woman and you can see the blood all over her and how she was stabbed in the chest. But Abigail Folger's injuries, what they, what she did to her face, the whole slash down her face and that, it's almost more disturbing, you know. And that's, Kremwinkle did that, not Charles Watson. Kremwinkle did that. Watson only came over to finally do the chest one, I assume. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, well, this is true. This is true as well. This is how it was in those days. Yeah, you couldn't have a bank. Really? In America, you couldn't have a bank. It's probably, the, well, I'll check whether that was the same in the UK, but what? You were not allowed, to, a woman was not even allowed to have a bank account. Sorry, let me know. Yeah, yeah. well, they were. They were obedient to Charlie. They were, he was like their leader, wasn't he? But he was more like a pimp than a cult leader. This is the thing. People that... This is when you're talking about this case. To straight people, right? It's hard to explain how it works. But no, this the, the way these girls acted was more like this man was their pimp than their cult leader. You know what I mean? This is the, That's the way... I, and their drug dealer. He was a drug dealer, right? They say he what he was a cult leader. No, it's like he was just the man, right? If you've got a group of young rebellious teenagers who are pissed off at society, you don't have to entice them to take drugs, right? You just put the bag of drugs down on the floor and you go, "There you go, kids. There's some drugs." And they go, "Yay!" And they take the drugs, right? He didn't have to force these kids to take these drugs. These kids were already doing that sort of shit. You know what I mean? It was like, yeah. Ooh. Yeah, I think women are in a much better place than we were in the past and we shouldn't fucking complain so much. But yeah, it is back. 
now well they're, they're they're starting to strip back the abortion laws in america aren't they i'm hearing there's something has happened suddenly yeah where they can yeah and there's been like crazy shit i've seen crazy cases like a man who raped a woman and the woman was pregnant and she wanted to have an abortion and the man was trying to the the rapist was trying to intervene and th this was actually being heard in court and i was like what the fuck is going on in america if that is happening jesus yeah it is very strange yeah sex trafficking and drug distribution what have i missed in the chat what were we talking about Oh, I'm all right. I'm at a thousand and four subscribers last time I looked. Let's have another look. Yeah, still a thousand and four subscribers. So it's going well. Going well, my friend. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> and I should promote my buy me a coffee link, actually. Yeah, because uh, I'm not I, I, I'm not doing this for money at all. But any donations are gratefully accepted because I buy books. Every month I pay for StreamYard, and yeah, it's, it, it's a hobby of mine. I don't expect people to pay for it, but any donations are greatly accepted. I have a buy me a coffee link. It's in the, if you go to my YouTube channel and you click the links, you'll see the links. And there's, there, there should be a link to my subreddit, my Facebook group, and the buy me a coffee link. If you want to make a donation, got to mention it. I hate mentioning it, but yeah, it does help. All gratefully received. And I see them on my bank account. Some people have recently. Thank you. Yeah, you grew up in right in the women's liberal movement. Independence was a priority, yeah, and it wasn't. And it sounds like when these women got into prison, basically, they met a lot of um, teachers. Well, this Charlene Faith woman, I'm not sure what she was. I think she was some kind of teacher. But she met the Manson girls. But yeah, a lot of women's lib people got to them very early and started to try and tell them what Manson had done to them. And it obviously took some of them more time to react than others. But uh, Leslie did first. Leslie was the one that was most receptive to it. And Leslie was the one that was with him the least time as well out of all of them, if you look at it. Cranny joined him first, then Susan was the next one. And Leslie only joined him like a year before. And Linda Kasabian was only there for a month before the murders happened. So, like, um, actually, it was like Cromwinkle and Susan were his closest disciples. And Leslie actually had more has more of a connection to Bobby than Charlie. And that's the shocking thing. She's been released without this being fucking really scrutinised as well. That's another thing that pisses me off. If she ever talks, I hope she does. Can I get the drugs? Well, that's if you uh, have the, yeah, well, now I'm at a thousand subscribers. I could have gone for that from 500. The dollar sign thing, the super chat, that's the super chat. But basically, yeah, I will get, uh, they take about 30% of the money and it takes a month. It takes over a month for it to get delivered to me. And they take a higher percentage. If you use my buy me a coffee link, it gets delivered to me within about five days. So it's a quicker delivery of the donation and they take less of a cut. So, yeah, I could do the super chat thing. And you can also do like weird, no, like funny gifts and that and give me donations. So I could do that. But I get more money if you do a buy the coffee link and and basically. And they make more money than I do, basically, if you do those donations, yeah. yeah. Mm. Super chat. I used to like doing super chats. Yeah, I like I like I used to like doing super chats in to just to support people. But the thing is they they YouTube makes more money out of that. Well no, I, I still make more money than them, but they make quite a lot of money out of that. And if you do my buy me a coffee link, that gives me a greater percentage of the profit and it and it gets to me quicker because with youtube uh the earnings are withheld for a month in case people do credit card chargebacks and shit yeah so yeah that's it yeah yeah just just keep sending the youtube then you just profit in youtube man 
Yeah, super chat. Well, they'll offer me that. Well, they already I could have applied for that because they lowered the boundaries for that. Yeah, and also I could do memberships as well. But I notice not a lot of people use emojis in my chat anyway. So I think my age group is not people that are really into using the emojis, like when you're typing and you do the little faces and symbols and that. You're not into that, are you? But I can do a membership and I can do custom emojis. So I could make it so you could post little like Susan and Charlie and text faces or whatever, you know. <coughs> I can do little custom emojis that you could post in the chat. And you'd only have to pay about a dollar a month. And also your name gets shown in a different colour in the chat because you're a member. I could do channel memberships. And I could also do another tier where I did like more personal streams where I talk about my, you know, or different streams that are for you only, basically, if you're a member. And I would probably use that to vlog about my life more Good for people that are interested in that. I don't know. But yeah, these are the options that will be open to me now. I'm at a thousand subscribers, and I could have gone for the membership and the group, the super chat earlier if I wanted to, but I didn't bother. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, there was some Gen Z. I I like to use emojis in the chat. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, see, Linda's using the emojis, and I could do custom emojis. I could give you a little Charles Manson acid face grinning, little all the all the little and yeah yeah. Text, all the little emojis. I could give you those sorts of emojis. Booliosi. That I can give you, like, yeah, like about 10 custom emojis, basically, that you can use. So I could give you little, you know, the CIA logo, whatever. I could do, but I'll make up little emojis you can use and, and that. So would you be interested in that now that I've got a 1,000 subscribers? I don't know. Probably. I hope so. Gen X. I am Gen X as well, my friend. We're all Gen X here, man. Well, d d apparently, according to my um, user data, a lot of them are boomers. But yeah, I, I have a lot of boomers. But yeah, the, the youngest people that are looking at me are Gen X. Yeah, yeah. That's it. But most people are, dead, are boomers. And, and the young people nowadays don't know what a boomer means. This is what, and it's, it's making me sound like an old lady, right? But the young kids now call anyone who's older than them a boomer, right? I'm like, no, fuck off, mate, right? The boomers were the generation after World War II, the baby boom after World War II. They're my dad and my mum, right? Don't you call me a boomer, you little shit. And they are, they call you a boomer, right? They, they look at someone that's older than them and they go, you're a boomer. And like, I'm not a fucking boomer, mate. I'm generation X. Don't you call me a boomer? And um, but boomers were yeah, and a lot. Most of my audience are actually the boomers, and it happened in America as well. There was a baby boom in America. The same thing happened in England. But my mum and dad were boomers, and yeah, a lot of my audience are boomers by the same things. And it was boomers that was a uh, uh, you know young when this all happened, and you know, that so that's obviously why. Yeah, yeah. So your parents are boomers, yeah. My parents were the boomers. Yeah, boomers are dying off now as well. The uh, <clears throat> vaccine uh, killed off a few of them, didn't it? Yeah, that's it. Ah, uh, yes, and this is my buy me a coffee link. Oh, thanks for sharing it. No, but honestly, I'm not begging for donations. I'm not desperate. But every donation is gratefully received because I buy books every month. I pay for StreamYard and I pay for Canva and that. It's an expensive hobby, but I do love doing it and I don't expect you to pay for me. But yeah, all do all donations are gratefully accepted because I'm not on a high income, and some of these books I wouldn't have just bought anyway. I'm buying them just to do stuff with this channel. Oh, you a millennial? But the 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 cutoff point for Gen X and millennial is really unfair. Yeah, but yeah, and I I am I am very very late Gen X, but I feel really pissed off to be called a millennial because I was born in 1981. And some people say that uh, the cutoff for uh, Generation X is 1980. But I, I, I'm pissed off about that. I think that I have far more in common with Generation X than Millennials. Yeah. Yeah. Just make the trip as possible. 
Uh, let's see, can I copy and paste that? I don't think I can copy and paste that from there. It will take a lot of skullduggery, but no, I can do it, I can do it. I'm doing the hand thing, yeah, no, because it is important. <laughs> this is it vitally important? I'll, I'll edit this bit out. It is of vital importance, should I say. Now I have to find my own buddy stream. Wait a second. Right, and I'll try and mute it before we get the weird horrific feedback incident going on. Oh, come on. Sorry, I'll edit this bit out. Sweet Jesus. Why is it all taking so long to bloody load? We'll get there in a second. No, I would like to hear the, the clip of them all doing the hand thing. Because this is what they did during Cranwinkle's trial. Well, penalty phase bit. Oh, shite, what have I done? Where's it? Ah, here it is. There. Right, now, where was the link? But it was miles up. I've got, I've got a scroll through. I've, I've opened the thing. I'll have to copy him. Oh, no, you're a moderator, aren't you? So I can click it. Yay! Okay. Right, 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 right. Right, so she's just really good at that. There we go. It's all happening. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I don't know what's going on with that. Waiting for it to load. What happened then? Just nothing. Nothing. It looks like it's a broken link. Shit. You gave me that link. It's broken. Find a better one. It didn't work. Sorry about that. I let it out with the final. It was trippy, wasn't it? It was trippy for a second. It's just like, what? Yeah, Gen X, Gen X, that's the thing, yeah, and I was born in 1981, but I have far more in common than Gen X than uh, Millennials. I think of Millennials as the people that was born, you know, like, my friends, little brothers and sisters, you know, like the, the, the younger ones, it's like, no, I'm not fucking one of them. Little freaks. No, I have far more in common with Gen X than Millennials, definitely. Yeah, I won't go to an after show because this is a more casual one. Wow, I've got 53 views though. Thank you for showing, guys. Excellent. And, and we will watch some more of Chrome and Glenn in a second. And then let's down for playback. I'm sitting here getting drunk. I'm, I'm celebrating because I can't believe I have a thousand subscribers. I never thought I'd get to this point. I may try and get um, Beckham to come on, but I, I haven't even asked him yet. So, yeah, I don't know if that'll happen. And it won't be any shade to Danny and Paul as well. It's only because me and Beckham and Mike, way back in the COVID lockdown before Poolcast even existed, used to work together. And so it'd just be cool for my thousand su subscriber special to have uh, Mr. Beckham on here again. <coughs> I haven't asked him yet, though, so he, he might not. And, and he can also shed some insight on the FBI documents because of his job. And I've found a better, more succinct, succinct, succinct explanation for what the other Jerry Garcia document is than what he gave me on Reddit. And, yeah, and so we'll, I'll just get him to chat. But what the the only evidence of it is um, the Reeve Whitson stream, 
uh, if you go back to my, if you look through my channel, the Reeve Whitson stream, and that was not actually streamed to YouTube originally. That was a Facebook stream, and that's uh, Mr. Beckham from the podcast. Doing a show with me before podcast even existed, basically. Yeah, and that's me and Mike from Manson Family Mystique, the Facebook group Manson Family Mystique. And that was a stream that originally went to the Facebook group Manson Family Mystique. And I downloaded it and uploaded it to YouTube. And it's the Reeve Whitson thing that we did. And that's me and Mr. Beckham and Mike from podcast. And also, I called him back, and we did a stream that I took down. That's not there anymore, but I called our, uh, uh, Mr. Beckham back to do the part two to it, the, the revised edition of it, because I wasn't happy with the way we talked. I felt that it was really disrespectful to the victims. So we uh, we went back and we changed the stream and the part two to the CO Drive thing as me and Beckham on our own doing it. But yeah, I might ask, I, yeah, and I've not even officially asked him yet. Well, well, I'm going to ask him back on, on his own. And I've officially said no shade to the other two. It's not, it's not, not to do with that. It's purely because of the old association. And he may say no, but it, but he could help because we're, I'm going to be looking at FBI documents and we'll see because of his job. He helps. You'd love for uh, Shrek to sit down with O'Neill, Tom O'Neill. He did. He knows him. He did know him. He did know him, right? I next time Nicholas is in England for long enough for me to sit down and interview him. I'm going to try and interview Nicholas in person, and he did meet. Well, actually, I shouldn't say this shit. Actually, probably no. Bit controversial, but the things that Nicholas has told me privately about Tom O'Neill, and I don't know if I'm meant to be telling you. Shit, I've just suddenly, you know, uh, yeah, I probably shouldn't be saying this. Yeah, yeah, okay. But Nicholas and Tom O'Neill know each other. Yeah, yeah. Is that that's, uh, that's all I'll say for now. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah. So he's having a look at there. This is a story about Lady Naomi's lost a disability claim because she did a Christmas tree throwing contest and won. Fucking, I can believe it, yeah. There's other stuff. You're a boomer, 1961. I think so, I think so. I think you still count because it's the after World War Two, boom, in it. No, or is, no, no, you, that's too late. Yeah, no, 1961, you're after the baby boom, aren't you? Because boomers were teenagers in 61. Ah. Now you think you are a boomer? Because I thought the baby boomers were like 10 or 10 at least by 60. Because my mum and dad were boomers and my mum was born in 52, dad in 54. They're boomers, they're baby boomers. It's it's to do with the years after World War II, isn't it? But yeah, boomers are technically born in the 50s, I think, aren't they? Or late 40s, late 40s, early 50s. Because it's when the men came back from World War II and knocked up their wives. Yeah. No, yeah, I don't, I've got to work that out. I'll have to look into it now. I don't think so. I think that, no, you have to be been born in the early 50s to be the boomers that they're talking about, aren't you? Because that's a decade later, isn't it? Because my mum and dad were born in the early 50s. I'm pretty sure it's the, the cut-off point is the 50s to be a boomer. And the boomers were the ones that were teenagers and was being affected by all the CIA shit and all that. You know, that's the... Yeah. Ah, ha, 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 ha. There. That's the dates. That's the dates. Boomers are from 1943 to 1961. So, yeah, maybe just you are a boomer, Belinda. Only just because I'm the same for being Generation X because I was born in 1981 and apparently that's the total cut off point for Generation X. But I am not, I don't feel like a millennial. I'm not a millennial. I resent millennials. I, I feel much more like a Generation X person. 
Yeah, Boomer born in 47. And my parents were born in the early 50s, yeah. So, yeah, to be a boomer, you have to have been born in the 50s, or late 40s, 50s, don't you, basically. And the cut-off point is 1961 to be a boomer, yeah. So it's like the boomers uh, were the voters, you know, uh, for a lot of shit that happened recently in England. And it was their fault, like, you know, the Brexit stuff and that, yeah, yeah. So a lot of people are very angry at the boomers because if you look into who voted for Brexit, a lot of people don't even vote anymore. Only boomers vote. And they apparently voted for us to leave the EU, the maniacs, and destroyed everything. And now we're completely fucked. So fuck them, basically. The boomers, you cunts. The the British boomers, obviously you're Americans. You, did, you didn't fucking vote for nothing, did you? But no. But the pricks who voted for us to leave the EU need to get in the sea. That's all I have to say. Yeah. Well, no, they're millennials. No, if you was born after 1981, you're a millennial. And now there's Gen Z. After millennial, it's Gen Z, isn't it? I think. And the, so, like, some of the teenagers we're seeing now are the Gen Z. Oh, it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Baby boomers often shortened to boomers are the demographic cohort following the silent generation and preceding generation X. The generation is often defined as people born from 1946 to 1964, yeah. But it's to do with World War Two. It's to do with the men coming back from World War Two and knocking up a lot of women. And also there's a problem with, because um, obviously the conscription age in World War Two was much older than Vietnam, I've just found out. It was 40 for World War II, so all the men under 40 got sent off during World War II. And so women ended up going out with men who were young women and would end up dating blokes who were over 40. So a lot of women for this baby boomer generation got with men who were much older, right? So this baby boomer generation had men, had fathers who were a generation older two generations older than them so it was an abnormal thing this is why the 60s was so catastrophic if you studied psychology and sociology and shit and all social history this fucking all this bollocks i've been studying it this is why the 60s went so crazy it was because when world war ii happened a lot of women ended up marrying blokes that was way older than them so in the 60s a lot of people ended up having fathers that had a two generation gap between them and there was all this crazy music and the lsd and the short skirts and everything and it died this is why it was so catastrophic on society because a lot of a lot of these boomer generation people had fathers that were way older than normal so there was a double generation gap and also, people don't. Well, I've not seen studies looking into the 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 effect the Vietnam War had on the women, because there's been lots of studies done on the effect World War Two had on the women in the UK, but I've not seen a lot of studies done on the effect that the women that it had on the women Vietnam had on the women in America. But it actually explains a lot of things. Just to tell you a thing, that, like about they call it the operational sex ratio. It's a sociology term, but it's basically the amount of physically fertile men that are available to the physically fertile women. And so, when a war happens, and this is a subconscious thing, women don't do it consciously, but when a war happens, all the fertile men get taken out of the equation and sent off to war, and so you're left with all the old men. And this might explain a lot of things about the um, 60s, the way the women behaved in the 60s in America. Like, why was Abigail Folger dating these creepy old Polish guys? Right, Abigail Folger, think about who she was, right? She was a, um heiress. She had a lot of money. She was an educated woman. She could have been dating anyone she wanted. But the boyfriend she had before Wojciech Frykowski was this creepy old Polish guy. Like, why would these young American women be dating these creepy old Polish guys? 
and um, Sharon Tate married this well, he, old. Yeah, no, he was older than her. He was. He, he was quite old. Why? Why was Sharon Tate hanging around with these creepy old Polish guys? What was it all about? And it's to do with the operational sex ratio. And no one talks about this, the, the thing that this had in America at the time. But the younger men were being taken away to war. So you're left with these, these uh, younger men. The older men. You're left with the creepy older men. And this is why people like Abigail Folger were dating guys like Wojtek Frakowski. And why women like Sharon Tate. But for her, there's obviously a music, uh, a film industry connection, isn't there? He was a director. But it was all to do with fucking military shit, basically. They fuck with society. When there's a war, it fucks with society. That's the message you need to hear. And so all the men being, all the young men being taken out causes a disbalance. And it causes the young women to start dating creepy older guys. And that explains why all these women fell for a man like Charles Manson. And why Sharon Tate married a guy like Roman Polanski. And why Abigail Folger was dating a guy like Wojtek Frakowski. It's all because of the fucking operational sex ratio. Because of the Vietnam War, the young men were being removed. And so we was all left with these creepy bastards. Basically. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. It went nuts. More babies were born. This is why they're called boomers. Because there was literally a boom. There was a baby boom when I was about 10 as well. There's been loads of booms. Oh, I've got to take another break. I won't go to an after show because this is one of the more casual streams. I'll just do another break. Thanks for coming, everyone, though. Be back soon. Wait a minute. Let me turn that off the screen. I put a good song on. I don't know. Like what? Carnival of Bizarre. There you go.
it. Did I just? I didn't put the video on, did I? I thought I put the video on. Did, 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 were you just seeing Sam the whole time? That's good. At least you saw Sam. You weren't just looking at my ashtray. He has no idea as well. That's the best thing. He has no idea. He's famous now. You're famous now. I'll edit you out as well, you poor little bugger. I'll get edited out. You could see him. I didn't put the video on. Sorry about that. But no. At least you had some weird music to listen to. But I just had a fucking bizarre thought while I was in the um, bathroom there. Right? When the parole hearing, at the parole hearing, they're talking about her prior drug convictions and that. Her prior drugs. They don't mention the Mendocino thing. Right? Surely that comes up on her record when she's at a fucking parole hearing, right? Because she was in jail. They all were. Susan, Mary, Bruna, Charlie even shows up there and ends up in jail at one point, right? So, like, she was in jail for the Mendocino thing, and that was distributing LSD. Why didn't they bring that up? I just suddenly realised that. I just was thinking about it when I was in the bathroom. I was thinking, what? Why didn't they bring it up when they were talking about her prior, you know, drug convictions? I just made it. These parole boards don't fucking know who these people are. No, that was in 1996 as well. This was years ago, right? Why didn't they bring that up? Because she was in she was in jail for that. A bunch of bollocks. Yeah, good thing I didn't pick my nose. Oh, I, I went to the bathroom. It's a good job I muted the mic, otherwise you'd have been able to hear me urinate with the door open. It would have been embarrassing. Now I've reached a thousand subscribers. Oh my god. Uh. Oh, thank you for coming, everyone. I can't believe we've got 37 people here and I've been going nearly two hours. And this is just one of my casual Thursday streams. My thousands, <coughs> my thousand subscriber special will be uh, on Sunday. And I have, and I will, I'll talk to him privately. Hopefully, yeah, that, that, that would be great, actually. I hope he will do that. I'll, I'll try and get him to. He might not be able to. So I won't announce it. I haven't asked him, but yeah, that would be great. Because <laughs> Mike isn't, he's not great on camera. He's not a great person at speaking. He doesn't go down well on camera. I can't ask Mike back just to do us. But no, but these are the early days of my channel, guys. And Russ was a nice guy as well. I liked it. And I've done a stream where I did a tribute to Russ and I spoke about the problems with him and i don't want anyone to think he was a bad man and he died of a heart attack that, that and that was it but he wasn't a really awful man he did say some inappropriate things to people at some points but it was all because of fucking ambient shit basically <laughs> it was all, he wasn't a bad man it was oh bless him Yeah. His name was Figueredo, Russ Figueredo. He was an interesting bloke. The only time I was ever going to fly to America it was during COVID. I was trying to fucking, because I at the time I had a job where I had enough money, I could have bought a flight ticket, but it was fucking COVID, wasn't it? So they went, there was no flights to America, and it was before the vaccine as well. So there was nothing you could do. There was just like, if you went to a flight to try and book a Went to a website to try and book a flight to America. You just couldn't do it. There was just no way. And uh, oh, he lived in New York though, and he was a concierge. And he he really what well, you you'd have seen that. Oh, if you go back and look at the bloody, I've made a lot of the streams public again. My only streams, but he had a real New York accent, and he wasn't putting it on. That was literally how he talked. And his kids talked. I used to talk to his kids. And he was a concierge, and he had a, apparently he had a fleet of. He sold some of them off during COVID, but <laughs> he still had three left, I think. But he had sold off a few of them during COVID because he couldn't run the business anymore. But the concierge limo service around New York, basically, and he would dr drive you around and give you limo tours. And he used to give us limo tours on Facebook. He would just be filming it on his phone as he drove around, and he'd show us the Christmas lights in New York and shit like that. 
and he knew the Dakota building and he knew the um the doorman of the Dakota building on certain days. So if I had got to New York, he could have got us into the Dakota building and got us up to the floor that they did use to film Rosemary's Baby. Because there was only a tiny bit of that was actually filmed in the Dakota building. The, there's one shot where the woman throws herself off the front that's filmed at the Dakota building. And there's a top, there's like one corridor that they used in, in the film. There's not a lot of the Dakota building in Rosemary's Baby. But he could have actually got me into the Dakota building in that. And I considered flying to America, to New York, to meet him for that. But couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. I would have had the money to do it as well. But couldn't do it at the time. And now Russ has said, so can't do it. I could still fly to New York just to look at the Dakota building. But if I flew to America, you'd all want me to go to fucking California, wouldn't you? And California just it terrifies me. It's like California's cursed. I, I will not walk into California. I'm sorry. Hmm. Oh, you just started watching me when he died. Yeah, and I did. I know it's really dead. Because the, well, that was the first stream, really, because this this channel went silent for a little while. And when Ross died, I came back and did one stream, and I thought about, would I carry on? And I decided to carry on. Yeah, yeah. So I did that Ross Figueredo stream, and I did carry on. And there was other times I nearly quit. But um, the, what stopped me quitting, actually, at the time, I want to say this as well, what stopped me quitting when it happened was fucking literally people contacting me, and it was all women, all women contacting me saying, no, we like the show that you do. <coughs> and I saw in the groups uh, that we talk in, other women So no, I talked about the Manson case, and these men all shouted at me and silenced me, basically. And I was like, no, I won't be silenced. We can't be silenced anymore. Basically, can we? And there's, it's not just women, it's everyone now is talking about this case differently and seeing it in a different light and seeing Charles Manson in a different light, you know. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, everyone likes the fucking stream. I like the stream. And subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Let's have a look. Has anyone else subscribed? <laughs> I've lost my other legs. What have I done? Yeah, no, I'm still at 1004. I'm over a thousand subscribers. It's crazy. Yeah, like I say, I'm not going to go to an after show. I'll just let this run. Well, there goes the cat again. Let's see his weird little back. There you go. Wish tail. He's really stretching his legs out now. You can see his legs good. Let me see your head. He doesn't know what's happening, you see. Can't direct a cat, can you? He doesn't know where the camera is. I have to turn it down. I'd have to turn the camera down. Wouldn't I? Let's see you. No, oh, he's settled now though. It does look cute. It's so uh, that you can't see him. Sorry, yeah, these Thursday night streams are more just random streams as well. But I wanted to carry on with the Patricia Crow Winkle stuff. A little bit read you that about the fact that their defence lawyers were hiring private detectives and it wasn't just to look into the process church angle though he doesn't say what he was looking into I hear from other sources that he was after the connections to drugs and we know from the newspaper articles that he commented well they could have been there before you know so he, he seems to have known something about the Manson family having been there before doesn't he hmm So force feed me coke in a Denny's, like in the movie. What's love got to do with it? What does someone force feed someone coke in the movie? What's love got to do with it? Isn't that the movie about Tina Turner? I don't recall him force feeding her cocaine in a Denny's in that film. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I'm talking for. 
Yeah, I have heard Denny's are bad. It sounds something like what we call a little chef in the UK. The UK is anyone from the UK here? Yeah, the Denny's and the, the those sorts of restaurants sound like what we call a little chef or a harvester. Like when you're driving along, we call them service stations. Like along, the, we call them motorways. Our long roads where you just drive fast. We call them the service stations, and there's like general branded rep you know restaurants that are along these service stations we had one called the little chef and harvester i think you had harvester in the america as well didn't you yeah but these were all just like restaurants that were set up along the side of motorways or freeways as you would call them in the lay by <coughs> hmm What is it? Is it in a Denny's that he does that? What he shoves it in Tina's face and then smacks a backup singer so hard she does a backflip. Wow, yeah, it's a typical diner. Yeah, oh no, but no, the American chains came over here, right? The fucking the, the happy chef, and what I'm talking about is probably American style food. Yeah, it happened. This was I was born. I was. I only remember the eighties. I can't remember anything. And no, everything was very Americanized by then. It was the same thing, honestly. Don't let them kid you that we're any different, right? We've been exactly the same as you since the seventies. Everything, like literally, all our supermarkets are owned by the same people. Walmart owns Tesco's, and fucking, you'd be shocked. You'd be shocked, right? We're all owned by the same people. It's all the same. All our fucking motorway service stations and shit. They're all the same. It's crazy. Ooh. Yeah, food. Fucking, we have too much food, right? It doesn't matter who's got the best food. We've got fucking too much food in our societies, right? We fucking have too much access to food. That's why people have become so fucking obese and complacent. And there's people starving and, you know, fucking, it's a horrible round to go on, isn't it? But it's uh, just so unjust how we are. We have such a glut of food. We can get whatever we want, any time of the day we want. And there's people in the world that are starving, dying for lack of food. And it all relates back to the bloody 60s, basically. Right before, bit right in the fifties, right before the sixties happened, people just worked all day, and they lived a religious life, and they believed they get their reward in heaven, and they only bought what they needed, and they got on with it. Right then, the sixties happened, and it made everyone want uh, instant gratification. That was all it achieved. The, the, right, there was no fucking unlocking our egos and having a sexual revolution. Didn't make the human race better. It made us worse. It made us better consumers for capitalism basically it made everyone want instant gratification now and uh, like deny that you know you have to wait for your reward in heaven basically right we all just wanted instant gratification now and from the 60s onwards all through the 70s we all became better consumers we all bought more we all spent more money on leisure activities and that and timothy leary says that this made us smarter no it didn't it made us fucking better for the state that he was working for, the arsehole. I've drunk too much gin. I'll, 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 I'll present the evidence to you, right? This is this is what how it all happened, mate. I tell you, it is. There is. There's so much waste, right? We, sorry, went for the wrong. Yeah, yeah. There's so much waste. We have we have so much food that people get to six hundred pounds. There's a show called My 600 Pound Life, right? How does one human being reach 600 pounds? And how is that so common that they're making a TV show about it? That's disgusting, right? That's a sign that there is too much food available to us, isn't it? If someone can reach 600, if someone can get so fat, they can't even stand up, right then fucking that's a bad sign that is a bad sign that is a sign we have too much food of oh my god sorry i've just seen how far away my mic is i must have been screaming really loudly for you to be able to hear me i must be drunk 
I'm so sorry. How long? That's ever since I've come back from the toilet. My mic was that far away, wasn't it? <laughs> invented LSD. Hoffman. Hoffman invented the LSD in Switzerland, didn't he? And he worked for Zandos. And Zandos, yeah, ended up distributing it. I'm embarrassed, actually. How long was I talking with my mic that far away? And no one even said, Nancy, you're quiet. I must have been shouting so that right. My mic was over there. And none of you even, none of you, right. Oh, my God, how loudly am I talking? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I must have really been on a rant then. If none of you said, Nancy, you're quiet. <laughs> I'm terrible. No, no, I won't even put it on the screen. Don't call out people for eating, right? Fucking, it's a problem with all of society. We could all eat too much if we wanted to. And I, I didn't get that much overweight, but I did realise that I was eating too much just because it was too easy to eat too much, and I got down to an acceptable weight, you know. It is possible. But no, we're in a society that is encouraged to just instant gratification. That is all that the 60s achieved. It didn't cause spiritual enlightenment. All it caused was people wanting instant gratification. And that made us better consumers. That was all Timothy Leary ever fucking achieved. And in that MK Ultra reunion video, he actually says that. I will, I will isolate the clip and I will show it. He says, this is what we achieved. And he says, it made Americans smarter. No, it didn't. It made you better consumers. That's all they actually achieved. And it made it easier for men to get laid. Because women let down their guard easier. Because they got made to feel like they had a problem if they wouldn't, basically. And it was all quite rapey, if you look into it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And then Lil Milky stopped drinking milk. That's how bad it got, right? And Linda laughed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, serotonin. Literally serotonin. Yeah, you're right. You're right. See, I should put my psychology into place. Serotonin. Well, serotonin's a fucking con as well. That's, that's right. Serotonin is the chemical that makes you feel secure, right? Like, no matter what, you know what I mean? It's just like, so, like, if if you're taking uh, SSRI, so something like Prozac, or any of the other, there's many, many other different versions, but that's the most commonly known version, like a Prozac-type drug, it can induce a false sense of security because serotonin is the, the brain chemical that makes you feel secure and all right. So, like, if you're on one of these serotonin reuptake inhibitors, you could be sitting there thinking everything's all right when actually something really bad's about to happen. But because it's causing your brain to constantly flood with serotonin, you're not aware of the hazard. And this is why people went nuts and started thinking they were immortal and robbed banks and shit. And also, SSRI shouldn't be given to people under the age of 20. Because, yeah, it was a huge cover-up, but there's a, there's there's YouTube channels where ladies talk about this happening to them, and I had a bad episode on Siroxat when I was a child as well. Uh, the, the, these SSRIs, right, they shouldn't be given to people that are under 20 years old because it can cause you to want to self-harm when you would never even thought of that before, right? That's the twisted thing. These, So, yeah, know this. And doctors know it now, and they won't do it. Well, But sometimes they still fucking do, right? So if you've got kids or grandkids that are under 20 years old, and their doctors prescribe them fucking SSRIs, so something like fucking Prozac, get in there and tell them to flush it down the toilet, because it can cause you to want to self-harm, irrationally, even if you never did before, in people under the age of 25. These are weird side effects of the drugs that they give out. And that's the psycho. That's the drugs that, that your doctor would prescribe you. Doctor, prescribe me the fucking drug that made me want to do. I don't want to even describe what it what it made me want to do. 
But a doctor prescribed me that, and I didn't get no compensation. No one did. No one fucking did. And people died. There's there's women who killed their kids because of these drugs, if you look into it, right? The, the shit that happened on these drugs. And the pharmaceutical companies just get out of it. Siroxat, look into the drug Siroxat, right? It was a, like, a drug like Prozac, or Fluxatin is its real name. And Screaming Lord Such as well. Screaming Lord Such died on Siroxat. There's a big scandal, big scandal. And Big Pharma just got away with it again, because they are Big Pharma. And the people that uh, prescribe these drugs obviously have mental health issues, so there's always like debatability. Oh, did it, was it the mental health issues that made them do this shit or not? But there are cases, there are whole cases, which is whatever they call the drugs in America. Where women lost their shit and murdered their children and stuff, and it was because of the drug. Sorry, I've lost my lighter, that's why I'm one wibbling about. Yeah, they do some. They trust them too much. And like I say, I've I've been the victim of one of these scandals. And luckily for me, there was people around me that noticed and told me to flush the drugs down the toilet. <coughs> but I know, well, I've spoken to other people that was on these drugs and people under the age of 20 they now know this they won't prescribe them to people under the age of 20 and honestly if you have kids or grandkids and they've they've got anxiety and psychiatrists are trying to prescribe them drugs and it's an ssri and they're under the age of 20 ask why are you prescribing them that don't prescribe them that right because they now know right that it actually can cause a fucking malfunction that makes you want to cut yourself up and I won't go into detail because it's horrible, but yeah, I know details of people that have cut themselves up on it. And I had strange thoughts that I wouldn't normally have had that I reported to my doctor and she did report back to the pharmaceutical company. I know she did, but it was really disturbing for taking a drug that was meant to help with my depression, my mental illness. And it made me think about, and I'm not a person that naturally, some people just naturally have that inclination is just part of their illness but I've never normally had that inclination and I was given these drugs and I won't describe the thoughts I had but they were very graphic nasty thoughts of cutting myself basically and um, I reported this to my doctor and she reported it back to the pharmaceutical company and that and it turned out yeah I think it's 21 you shouldn't be perform be given these SSRIs unless you're over 21 because they can for give people vivid desires to harm themselves or others basically and doctors now know this and they should not be prescribing them to anyone under the age of 21 you must always enjoy the podcast I'm also, I shouldn't admit it so freely but who did? I think nowadays they don't care so much in the UK unless you're a dealer Yeah, sorry, these Thursday night streams are more casual as well. It's not like a big thing. Just hanging out. What time is it? It's 2.18 already. God. Yeah, they, no, they don't work. Nothing works at curing depression. There's, uh, there's drugs they can give you that can help take the edge off it and help you get through your daily life. And it is worth taking them. And they've refined them better now. Of all the SSRIs, the one that I took... That was good. Oh, fuck. I've forgotten the name of it. What was it called? The one I took that was good, I can't remember. There's one that's good. There's one that works. But, yeah, avoid Fluxatin and Siroxat. Fluxatin is Prozac, the real the medical name for Prozac. Prozac is one that made people go crazy and want to rob banks and shit. Avoid Prozac and avoid Siroxat. What was the one that I took that was good? I can't even remember what it was fucking called. It's so long since I've had to take them, but I've got quite bad... Um, well, I can cope with it now. I, re I can reason myself out of it, so I don't have to take the medication anymore, but I have what's called OCD. Oh, what's the medication that I took? B12. 
But it is it is an SSRI, but there's one that's good. But the two you should avoid are Fluxatin and Siroxa. I can't remember the name of the good one. That was embarrassing, sir. I chose the subject. It'll come back. No, it's not Zoloft. Zoloft is fucking similar to that. Is like Siroxa. I think Zoloft is what they called Siroxa in America. Yeah, well, there's, there's, there's studies in um, the UK studying that as well as an antidepressant with psilocybin. And it's such a small dose, it doesn't make you trip. But yeah, it could work in the long term for LSD, for um, LSD, for depression. Fuck's sake, what have I done with all my bloody lighters? The cat is really sat on it. But it's in my lap and you're just sat on it, aren't you? No? Ah. I can't believe this. What have I done with my lighters? It's not even a real candle. I can't even light a cigarette off it. It's, 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 it's crazy. It's crazy, guys. The struggle is real, guys. Yeah, Adderall is literally meth. This is the thing, because the, 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 the title that I gave to my bloody Max Jacobson stream, I think people... Think, oh no, that sounds too extreme. They don't believe President Kennedy could have been on meth. No, it's literally the same thing. What the doctors were injecting into President Kennedy is literally the same thing as the methamphetamine that the guy you see shouting at the lamppost outside the drugstore because they won't sell him fucking Sudafed, right? It's the same stuff that they're addicted to as what they was in injecting into President Kennedy. It is a thing. It is real. Oh my god. Oh, there it is. It's on the floor. I found it. Oh, the floor went crack the cat. Oh, yeah. No, it is live. How many light, you guys? Sorry about that. That was a drama, wasn't it? What happened to my lighter? Seroquel is an antipsychotic. You mentioned that. I don't know. Lithium, that's a mood stabiliser and antipsychotic in it, I think. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, a lot of the school shooters were on the SSRIs. Yes, yes, the school shooters, yes. That's very, very relevant, right? The SSRI drugs, look into it, right? Look into it. People under the age of 20 should not be given these drugs like Prozac and that. And you look into these lads that did the school shootings, how many of them? And that guy that went and did the shooting at the cinema, uh, the Batman 2 thing, right? What was the, yeah, what was that caused by? And no, it wasn't the CIA. It wasn't the CIA that wasn't bad. No, I think it was caused by the fucking antidepressants that lad was given, right? And it's not an excuse for their actions. They must have obviously been a bit fucking psycho to want to do these things, to be capable of doing these things. Anyway, but... Right, these people were mentally ill, were sent to a psychiatrist, and were, the, the, the psychiatrist gave them a, a medication that was meant to treat them, and it made them worse, right? And that is bad, and that, sh that should backfire on the pharmaceutical companies. So, yeah, no, it's not entirely the excuse for why these people carried out these crimes, but fucking, the, the, they were in therapy and they were being prescribed drugs to treat their conditions that made them worse. And they tried to cover it up. And the case of that guy who did the shooting in the cinema, the, the dressed as the Joker, right? He was on these drugs too, look into it. And a few of the school shooters, I'm pretty sure that some of the, the two original lads, the most famous ones, one of them at least, was on SSRIs. It's bad. They should not give them to people that are under the age of about 20. Hmm. Oh, so you see that they're shrinks, no, but this is the problem as well, Sam. These drugs are meant to be prescribed with a therapist that they see weekly, but this is the problem. They don't see a therapist, 
right? The, 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 the doctors just prescribe them the drugs and they don't see a therapist. And if you look at the instructions from the pharmaceutical companies, they say these drugs are meant to be prescribed with a therapist. But especially, well, where I live, right, we have the National Health Service, right? So you're put on a waiting list for therapy from when your doctor says you need therapy. And so it might be years, it might be a year before you actually see a therapist. But the doctor gives you this medication before you've even seen the therapist. So you could go out and do fucking what the, 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 the medication could have any kinds of side effects. No one's fucking monitoring you. You see your GP once a month or whatever. No one's fucking monitoring you, really. And if you look at what these pharmaceutical companies say, right, these drugs are meant to be prescribed in, in conjunction with therapy. But in reality, these doctors are prescribing drugs and they don't know if the person's going to get therapy when they take these drugs at the same time. And this is why all these school shootings happen and all this shit happens. It's big pharma. Yeah, yeah, I am acid. Patricia Sorry. Oh, no, I've got to scroll back up. Can't scroll back up. Someone said it. I am acid. That was in my thumbnail, though, wasn't it? I put it in my thumbnail. I took so much acid. I am acid. Hmm. Pill mills. Well, I want to get into the... No, I'll, I'll get into the Acid King case as well. You know, Ricky Casso, the Acid King. That case is really tragic, and there's a really big parallel where, like, like literally, because people say if in a different decade the Manson case had been heard, right? If in the 80s this case had been heard, they would have all walked, right? Look, right, I'll show, I'll show you the Acid King case, right? Then fucking everyone walked after Ricky Casso died. And these kids were as guilty as the Tate LaBianca kids all were. They was all as guilty. But after Ricky Casso died, they all just walked. And it was all because they was on drugs at the time the murder was committed. So no one could recall what really happened reliably. And there's lots of evidence. Uh, all the parole hearings, even in the penalty phase, they're all saying, I can't recall stuff at certain points. Do you know what I mean, right? They can't recall stuff. And everyone, no one went to prison for that lad's murder. A lad was murdered and buried in the woods. Right. Lots of people witnessed him being murdered. Two lads took part in his murder. Other kids were taken up to look at his body after the murder. No one went to prison. No one at all went to prison for those murders, for that murder. And the, the same thing could have happened with the Manson trial. Was there not such a cover up and not such a shying away from are these people insane or not, basically? They all could have walked. Well, I'll get into it. I'll get into it on other streams. I'm going to show you. There's just one There's one clip of the lawyer for uh, the other guy, Jimmy Troiano. The co-defendant. That would have been the co-defendant of Ricky. But he committed suicide in prison, didn't he? So, And they, they just blamed everything on Ricky and they whitewashed it, right? But there was lots of kids involved with that murder that by law was equally accessories and should have all... But no one ever went to prison for those murders. <coughs> We're talking about, yeah. God bless America, right? These girls are rotting in prison. One of them died in prison, right? But fucking for the acid king murders, fucking everyone walked. Everyone walked. And they were not very different. And I will, I will present this to you and I will show you it. They were not very different, really. <laughs> yeah Acid King is a good band when I said the Acid King because there's so many men who have actually been called the Acid King right? but the Acid King murders I'm talking about the Ricky Casso murder and it was all a drug related murder again because I was interested in looking at drug related murders to talk about for my channel because I'm trying to show you how the Manson murders absolutely look like drug related murders and so i looked at the acid murders thing and yes but there's a but the, the verdict in that case is you know quite telling and this was only what 10 years later 10 years about 10 years just over 10 years after the manson case 
but society's attitude to shit had changed and all those kids walked all of them not one of them went to prison the, the the lad they blamed it all on they committed suicide and everyone else walked well did Troiano do any time I think Troiano did some time didn't he I'll have to look into it again but no uh, you think Cass Elliot was murdered well I've done a stream about it I've done a whole stream about it and I honestly don't think she was I really don't think she she was murdered I think that she died as a result of the, the way the music industry treats singers and she was desperate for money if you look into it at the time and she had to go and sing five nights in a row and people who aren't singers won't understand this right but fucking right when you're a singer no one is supposed to sing more than three nights in a row without a rest because it's too exhausting for you right people don't understand this about singers and in this in the 60s and the 70s they overwork singers chronically and Cass Elliot was also overweight, obviously, wasn't she? So uh, there was more stress on her heart at the same time. And any singer would be vulnerable to dropping dead from being made to work five nights in a row, like she had just done. She had just done five nights in a row at the London Palladium, and she needed the money, if you look into it, right? She had tax debt back in the UK. Her daughter was, would have been left with loads of debt, I imagine. Her sister took it over. But when, when Cass Elliot died, she was in debt, right? And she had done this five nights in a row in order to make money. And she shouldn't have done five nights in a row. They were saying at the end of the people were seeing her sneezing and coughing, right? Which means she was starting to get respiratory infections or whatever. And honestly, uh, if you, you've got to watch my stream about her life and death, I, I go into it in extremes. But the, the things that singers are prone to, and she shouldn't have done five nights in a row that could have killed anyone, even her age, right? But she was also overweight. She had these other problems. And she had also, a year before, been in a coma from a Nembutal overdose. And she'd been overworked by John Phillips in the studio and all this shit. And all this shit that happened was going to uh, took a toll on her heart. And then she was made to go and do five nights in a row at the London Palladium. And it's not a shock that she dropped dead. It, I don't, no one needed to murder her, right? Maybe that was murder, though. No, but Linda, no, this is a point. No, I've just suddenly thought of it. I've just suddenly thought of it. But maybe the way she was made to work was the murder. Do you know what I mean? They knew They knew what it was going to do. They knew what it was going to do to her, and they just let it happen. So it wasn't. Uh, she wasn't, like, deliberately assassinated. No one gave her some kind of overdose that killed her in that bed that night. But they let her overwork knowing that it would kill her. And that Jimmy Webb thing, right? Jimmy Webb says that he spoke to her in a pub in London when the night that she finally admitted that she had seen something at Sharon Tate's house, right? So she was literally just being able to talk about what she'd seen and then she goes and drops dead but he says he sat with her in a pub in london and how many times was she in london so he must be talking about the week she was you know about to die and then she, that's it she died so 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 yeah that is that is questionable as well so it seems like the second she started to be able to talk about what she saw that night she suddenly drops dead but yeah, honestly, watch my stream about her life and death and her drug use and everything. And it's no surprise, actually, that she dropped dead when she did. She didn't need to have been assassinated. But the very work pattern that she was being given and the amount of drugs that she had been given in the past and all that could all have been a systematic assassination, if you want to really, like, you know, look at it that way. Yeah. No, don't, James, though, no, no, don't, fucking, it's not that. We shouldn't talk about her fucking eating. It wasn't that. It wasn't that. You know, it's a laugh. But no, it wasn't just her fucking overeating and her weight. Lots of women, she was, what, 30-odd? She was, no, lots of women who had her weight. Well, think about it nowadays. Her top weight was 300 pounds. We have a show called My 600 Pound Life, right? It's normal for women to get much fatter than Mama Cass ever was at her top weight. Mama Cass was not that big compared to what we have nowadays. 
right? So it is uh, odd that she died of a heart attack at what age was she? I think she was about 31 or 32, wasn't she? <coughs> <coughs> but if you look at the way she was forced to work her whole life, 32, yeah, I think she was 32. So it's an unusual age for d to her to die. And if you look at the bloody stream, apparently the coroner commented it's unusual for a woman her age to dive overweight, even at that day, even at that age, you know, that age. Yeah, though it affects your health, it's unusual for a woman to die at 32 just from being overweight. And yeah, compared to today's standards, considering that, you know, our standard is someone who's really fat is 600 pounds. Actually, and Mama Cass also did lose a hundred pounds, so she ended up being closer to two hundred pounds by the time uh, she died. She did lose a hundred pounds, so she was actually not as fat by today's standards as women are nowadays. You know, yeah, yeah, that's it. And she was in shitty health and on a shitload of drugs, but no, it wasn't even that. It was just the, the overwork. People were saying she was coughing and sneezing as well. It's easy to get a respiratory tract infection when you're a singer. And and though what she said, well, no, she was loud. She her voice was loud because she was a musical singer type singer, right? So though it looks like this is the thing when when you're standing there singing, it looks like you're doing nothing, but you're actually using about seventy five muscles, and you're using more oxygen then it takes for your brain to stay awake, right? So you're at high risk of fainting and shit like that. People don't understand what you're doing when you're singing. Your body becomes the instrument. You're playing an instrument and your whole respiratory system becomes part of that, you know? And so, like, when singers faint, damage has been done to their heart. This is the thing. I want people to watch the Mama Cass stream because it's so sick what, what John Phillips did to them. Hit her and Denny. Denny as well. He made them sing beyond their capacity and he made them faint. And he would make them faint regularly. He was a month, you know, and well, that's not worse than doing his own daughter and all that sort of stuff, is it? You know what I mean? But he was a monster. He was a horrible man. And in every, every respect, you know, he fucking didn't care what he did to people's health or mental health or even his own daughter's mental health. And oh, evil man. Hated him. Yeah. Sorry. And then Pete Frampton joined in. Yeah, he was. He was a sadist. He got off on causing other people pain, I think. It looks like it, doesn't it? It does look like John Phillips did get off on causing other people pain. Jesus, I've been going nearly three hours. Thanks for watching, everyone. It's nearly bloody 3 a.m., isn't it? But yeah, that's oh, great. I can't believe I'm at a thousand subscribers. Nah, but no, what it is, is the reason is, and you look into the bloody Rolling Stones around this time, I've done streams about the Redlands bust and that, and the Rolling Stones were constantly getting busted, and we had premises laws in the UK, we still have them now, but they're not as obeyed as strictly as they were back then, right? But we have these premises laws that if you was allowed it's so you don't have to have been found guilty of possessing a drug or selling a drug. If you allowed your house to be used for someone to take a drug, you can be done for that. This is your premises laws. And that night, Mama Cass had been at uh, Mick Jagger's house because they'd thrown a party in her honour after the tour, so she'd had to go to the house. And people said at the time she was coughing and sneezing a bit and she had a drink. But she said hello to everyone and that, and she was cheerful. And then she went back to her hotel. And uh, what you read in her biography is the manager went into her room and there was a ham sandwich by the bed, but no bite had been taken out of it. It had never been a bite, so she'd never choked on the ham sandwich. Right, but he found liquid cocaine, a vial of liquid cocaine, and he found a bottle of sleeping pills, and he removed them from the room before... That anyone was called and then he went downstairs and he had to come up with a story quickly that made it look like there was no drugs involved and it was all because if she'd been found to have died having taken these drugs 
than the Rolling Stones. Mick Jagger could have been called into, oh, you allowed your premises to be used for Mama Cass to take this cocaine and these sleeping pills that it res resulted in her death. And then Mick Jagger wouldn't have been able to tour for a few months or whatever, right? So because it was, again, it's the Rolling Stones' fault, right? The fucking Rolling Stones. Because it would have inconvenienced the fucking Rolling Stones, right? They covered up the circumstances of this poor woman's death, basically. And so now we'll never know exactly why this woman died because everything has been kept top secret. And it's all because of the fucking Rolling Stones. It's because the Rolling Stones lawyers got involved because they didn't want fucking Mick Jagger to get nicked for premises shit. Oh, I hate them. Well, I don't hate them. Well, I do. No, I do. I do. Great. They have caused so much trouble, though. They have caused so much trouble, though, the Rolling Stones. And uh, they're not national treasures. So I, half the well, I don't know. But I know a lot, quite a few people, actually, yeah, who do see them as national treasures. They're assholes. They brought us into disrepute. They're awful men. Hmm. Oh, God, it's nearly 3 a.m. We've been going for, what, three hours. Oh, thank you for watching, everyone, anyway. We had a bit of a react, didn't we, to Krenwinkle. Excellent. Yeah, I'll probably end this now. So I can go to sleep. Oh, but thank you for coming, everyone, and tune in on Sunday night, because, yeah, I'm doing the Grateful Dead stream, and that's going to be a more organised stream, where I tell you about, yeah, these FBI files on the Grateful Dead. And how the the the, the so-called fucking proof that the the, the Great for Dead CIA has been greatly exaggerated, and there's a funny conspiracy theory about the well. Some people will fucking probably believe it's true to this day, but yeah, yeah the, but there's a funny conspiracy theory about a Grateful Dead recording that exists, and I'm going to try and find the recording. Maybe in the after show we can listen to the recording. But I'll read that out as part of the show. But yeah, basically, any any fucking references to the Grateful Dead definitely being CIA. Question them, because no, there's actually not a lot of evidence that they were fucking CIA at all. Hmm. Yeah, well, thanks everyone. Let's just check before I go. Have I gained any more subscribers in the last... No, I'm still at 104. Oh, that's good. I'm over a thousand subscribers. Yeah, shit. Yeah, I've got to go. Our podcast streaming tonight. I don't mean to undercut them. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah, and I will. I'll talk to Beckham, actually, in a minute. I'll see if I can get him to join me for the thousand subscriber thing because he could give some input because there's FBI documents. Just for old time's sake. Oh, excellent. Oh, good night, everyone. Yeah, thanks for coming and tuning in on Sunday. Excellent. Good night.